OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you! I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 love, I, love, I love my county, you know. We love John it's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. You are very welcome along to episode six of The Hurling Pod with Paul Murphy and James Skehill. Plenty for us to look back on on the week just gone by. The two semi-finals have now produced an all-monster affair at Semple Stadium this coming Saturday in the Allianz National League Division 1 final. It'll be Westmeath against Down in Division 2 looking to replace Offaly who were relegated following their seven point defeat against Antrim delighted to say that James and Paul are with me as always to take a look back at the hurling and to look forward to this week how are you getting on lads? Good well Good well thanks Um, There's a lot to talk about from the weekend just gone by do we start with the close game James or do we start with the hammering which do you want to go with? We may as well start the hammering (laughs) We'll save Paul and Hassel for the few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing. I was looking back at the YouTube comments from last week, and as you can see on screen, if you're watching on YouTube right now, whisper into my ear, James, Wexford are back was the feeling. Uh, Wexford fans were on the crest of a wave after winning all five games. They'd rounded off the end of the normal section of the league. They were going in to play against their neighbours, Waterford. Stephen Bennett had been ruled out of the game. Park Manny mm-hmm. wasn't going to start. There was every feeling in Wexford, James, that they were going to put in a big performance and they were going to get to a league final and we saw the most flat Wexford we've seen all year yeah we did we saw <clears throat> we saw basically the complete opposite of what they produced over the last five games um, and I was just thinking after the game you know it's easy to look at the scoreline and say I, of course it was, it was a one-sided affair but it was more than that like this this to me feels like a bit of a damaging performance you know not just that they're knocked out of the league fair enough but like they're playing Galway in, in, in two and a bit weeks time and you know Players have to recover. There's no two ways about it. Like, but the, the manner in which they were defeated by Waterford, um, who clearly passed them out now in the rankings, um, was was quite telling. Like there was so much, so much happened in the game that you would say shouldn't happen together, if that makes sense. So I'm looking at the pokeouts. Um, they're offering the ball to uh, to Waterford, no problem. Waterford are putting down to the corners time and time again. Waterford get the ball in the corner, they take them on to get a score, and this just keeps repeating itself over and over again. And you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, Winner Wexford actually going to counteract this? and push up in Waterford and get a bit of energy into their, into their defence. Never came. And even their efficiency and the way they executed. Um, I know like if from, you can, I can pick on one or two players, but I won't say, but certain passes that they, they put forward, um, <clears throat> it looked like the, the player they were passing to was the one that made the mistake, but the passes were so bad behind them, you know, over their heads, it just looked like the execution was all wrong. And it's, it's bad from when Dar Egan says after the game that they lacked energy. So that's the, that's the first thing they should bring. Like if you're associating any kind of performance with Wexford, the first thing you write down is, is, is energy, you know, and then the rest will follow. You see a very tight defence, right? Obviously ranked number one in the league up to date, and you see energy going forward. And unfortunately, those two just weren't there. Terrible performance all around. But again, on contrast, that Watford were, were, were fantastic. Yeah, we'll pick into that in a minute. But just looking at the wider picture on this one, Paul, the energy point comes up. Is that is that a fair thing for a manager to say after a game? I mean, it was definitely lacking. The intensity wasn't there. Uh, the turnovers that we saw from Wexford, the high-intensity performances, particularly against Limerick and Galway, that was way, way down at Nolan Park yesterday. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's very fair for Darry Egan to come out and say that. It's one of the things, you know, there's some areas that managers can just come out and say it straight in, in, in an interview after the game. And it's it's not an attack on the players, but it's, it's a way for the managers to maybe say, look at publicly... The players have to kind of own that one because, look, the management control a certain amount. They do tactics, they do different things, what way we want to set up and so on. But the energy is completely back to the players. Um, and you can even say about Wexford that, that uh, over the weekend that maybe they tried something new tactically. But regardless of trying something new tactically, um, the commitment to what they were doing just wasn't there. They were very, like we were saying, they're very flat in the first seven minutes. Uh, they handed over, so they won one of of the first of of their eight puckouts. So they won one of them. So they gave Watford seven, and Watford won three of their first three. So Watford won ten puckouts in the first seven minutes, and Wexford won one. And I was looking at what Wexford were doing. You know, they were trying this short puckout, but often the receiver was just standing flat footed, waiting for it. And Austin Gleason to come in and put in a hurl, or Desi Hutchinson, or maybe okay, Mark Fanning. Look, not all of them are going to work out for you, but. It just seemed to be all over the place. It wasn't, you know, 
at one stage it might be a defender, another stage it might be an error in terms of striking the ball, it might be a handling error. But that just reflected maybe where the minds were at, that they just weren't 100% tuned into the game. Whereas, you know, Watford didn't even take off at, at, at a speed that we've seen them take off in other games, like let's say the Tipperary match. But they were still at enough of a pace, or at least a higher pitch than Wexford, that they, it looked like from, from minute one that this was going to be, you know, it, it could be a route altogether, as it turned out to be. So, as much as maybe we could look at the game and say, look, Wexford didn't deploy their sweeper as much as they traditionally do. The bottom line was once once they were going with their, they were turned back facing their own goal, they just weren't tracking back. There's another sign that their energy wasn't there and that their their attitude was maybe a small bit off. So those are things Darry Egan would be looking at saying, okay, we might be trying something new, but what happened here in terms of the commitment to our play and, and, and the energy? So that's definitely something that regardless of what way you're trying to play, you can call that out straight away after the game. And something definitely needs to be called out this close to championship. Yeah. James, when it came to the puck out, where do you diagnose the issue, particularly for the Aussie Gleason goal that comes from the turnover on the Wexford puck out? Because to me, I don't think it's entirely down to Mark Fanning. Again, you're talking about static players when it came to options for his puck out. And then Wexford weren't in a good defensive shape when the ball was yeah. turned over either. Yeah, like, like don't get me wrong, let's say every goalkeeper nowadays is trying to rush a puck out, out sooner. He's trying to get catch a, probably an unorganised uh, attack on, on the opposition and that's fair enough right but Fanning had time to assess it and he obviously saw very little up the field and Kilkenny were very good at it they, they nearly entice you to go for the short you know what I mean so they, they'd give you just enough space between between your defender and where they are that you'll say right I can get the puck out off um, but then as soon as you shape to hit it they're moving while you're looking at the ball they're obviously moving to the target and I think that's what happened I think when Mark Fanning looked up he saw sufficient space between Ozzy Gleeson and the defender and said right I have time to get this out and then he probably underhit it a bit, to be honest. You know, that probably needs to get a bit more pace. The defender needs to probably be more mobile. Like a static target is a bad target. Like you want to be moving to the ball, let's say, away from the opposition as opposed to be standing, waiting for the opposition to come to you. So I think it was probably a combination of a couple of errors. I would always say like that it's easy to point the finger at the goalkeeper and say, oh, that was a bad puck out. But puck outs in general, especially in today's game, is, is very much a collective effort. You know, it's very systematic. So, obviously, the fast one to the cornerback is just quick. That's the goalkeeper. But nowadays, in terms of a system overall game plan, there are so many movements, there's so many spaces that you that your backs need to go to and they need to assess, like, even around themselves, um, what's the best space for me to go to. I, I can't just... You can't just tell a man, go to stand in the wing and I'll hit the ball. They need to be very, very proactive and looking for the ball in a space that they can receive it and start an attack. There is no point hitting a ball to a defender or midfielder when the secondary thing is going to happen is a tackle from the opposition, you know? You want to be getting the ball in a bit of space that you can start an attack. The objective of a puck out, sharp puck out, is to start a goal. That's what you want. You're trying to get a goal at the far side. You're trying to get a score. So I just think it was probably, it's easy for the novice to look at Mark and say, oh, it's Mark's fault. You know, like Mark Fanning was excellent yesterday. <laughs> like he conceded five goals, like, but still he was one of Wexford's best players. They had 10 goal chances at Watford yesterday. So like, it's easy to point to one opportunity and say that's his fault, but it's a collective effort for me. Yeah, I, th I think genuinely, James, there was eight good goal chances. There were two others that... I think there was a sloppy hand pass in the second half when Waterford yeah. were already about 15 points up that I think if the game had been tighter, Waterford would have worked that chance a little bit better. Like He makes two top-class saves that looked like nailed on goals and he yeah. was given very little chance for the goals that went in. So it's not really a, a rag on fanning here. But does that not kind of tell the story of the tale from Wexford's defending though? Like I thought it was intriguing last night, James, that you had David Fitzgerald, the manager from the last few seasons, who was actually on League Sunday breaking down Wexford's defence and where the issues were. And he saw that one of the central problems were he deployed Foley previously not as a, a flat centre half back as number six. He was his sweeper to keep things tight around the back. And his feeling is that they've lost a little bit by not having Foley in that specific position anymore. I, do, I don't buy that at all. Like, like <clears throat> the, the, what I saw yesterday from Wexford's perspective was, was there were similarities to the way they've set up in previous years. You know, they were quite robotic. It, it felt like that they were told to be in a certain position at a certain time and they just, they just forgot to look what's around them. You know, like, Paul, I'll tell you, like, as a defenseman, yeah, grand, you'll be told to get back to the goal when there's an attack on, but the first thing you do is you go to the ball or go to the next man that's there and you stop everything in front of you. You know what I mean? But they just, there was, just, there was and there wasn't as, as if a case whereby we've seen, especially with Waterford against Tipperary, where Waterford had numerous runners. That wasn't the case. Like, they weren't overloaded uh, numerically. So, like, Wexford had opportunity to take a man each and go to the ball, and they didn't. And, like, they, they did saunter through now Watford saunter through for a couple of goals that should be severely disappointed with especially Bennett's one that one like he should have been with respect he should have been mowed down do you know what I mean and, and not got near the goal at all Ozzy Gleason's two they came off errors as we know 
Um, and, and a touch of brilliance for Aussie's second one. But they just, they were very, very loose. Wexford were awful loose, and there was no real aggressive intent, you know, as a defender, like which I would take big issue with. You know, I can take a bit of genius from Aussie and take a bit of, you know, great skill, but I cannot take lack of attitude or, or aggressive intent from a, defense, a defender because that just sign signifies he doesn't want to be there for the fight. And when you watch them, when, uh, when Binnett was going for his goal, and you watch, as Paul was saying, the pace at which the Wexford backs were going back towards their own goal, it wasn't the, it was below a jog you know there was no real intent to get back there and kind of save it so they just they, they gave up let's, let's be honest about it. 20 minutes to, to go the, the match was over and they gave up it all petered out Paul how much of a concern is that defensively particularly like the space that Wexford were leaving behind so on the one hand look Waterford were able to flood some runners through from midfield who some of them weren't being very well tracked back anyway but from a defensive point of view look at the space that Wexford left when you're up against Desi Hutchinson one of the quickest and probably one of the best movers in a forward line in any team in the country as well yeah um, it, it seemed a peculiar one particularly when you're saying you're, you're, you're mentioning the likes of Desi Hutchinson um, you know there'll be alarm bells ringing when if you're leaving space in front of him because that's one of the first areas teams are looking to cut out with top class forwards particularly players who play the likes of Desi Hutchinson let's say if we use someone like Bonner Maher who Bonner is kind of a scavenger will go looking for ball you're not looking to play the ball necessarily in front of him he's the one that goes and breaks it up Desi is the man that you're looking to feed and give him good quality ball so it's, it is an unusual tactic to deploy it particularly when you're you're, you're seeing the strength of the, Wex, or the Watford forward line at the moment it was also something interesting that I was looking at Watford as well in that they were actually striking quite a lot of long ball, which was, I don't know, was it something that they'd weighed off that maybe Wexford were going to set up the way they were going to set up? Or maybe they just read it in the first few minutes and said, lads, they're actually leaving a bit of space here in front of the forward line. Let's start striking long ball. Because it's not something we're really associating with Watford at the moment or over the last while. They tend to work the ball up. As we're saying, you know, we're talking about them against Tipperary, work those channels, and they've lads sprinting up the line, and they're, they're, they're calling the opposition defence onto them. But they were getting the ball, the head up, and they weren't afraid to strike it from the 45, which a lot of teams aren't doing as much at the moment. But Watford, whatever Watford saw happening on the pitch yesterday, they were delivering that ball uncharacteristically of them really early in. But it was working for them. So I think they just made the call that, hang on here, lads. They got the message around to the rest of the players, say, lads, they're playing a pretty high line here. The half hour line is sitting out. We can feed the boys inside. You know, we can feed Kylie inside. We can feed um, Desi Hutchinson and so on. And I think they just called it as they saw it on the pitch. But it was a, it was an unusual one for Wexford. And I heard some people saying even afterwards, I was chatting to one or two people after the game, and they were, they were saying that maybe Wexford didn't want to show their hands so close to championship. Look, we saw Brian was sitting in the stand and different things. Hard to believe. I don't know if that's the case. But, you know, people are reading into it different. And it, it, is, it makes for interesting reading, I'll put it that way, because... I, I was asking myself as well, why did Wexford step away a little bit from what, what we know? And it was it was like looking at a different Wexford team, really, from what we've seen in the league. We were sitting here last week, you know, and James, you tipped him to win the match. And it was a hard one for me to call. I went with Watford, but barely, you know. So the Wexford we saw yesterday, you know, it had a lot of people scratching their heads, wondering, first of all, why they, they set up the way they set up. And then also just the things we talked about there now, that question and why their energy was so low. So there's a lot of things... Um, I think in the post-mortem today that Darry Egan will be looking at but maybe they know maybe they have more knowledge on it obviously as they would than we do It's a hard thing to reconcile James if you consider this felt a little bit like the game against Dublin at Crow Park in the Walsh Cup where <laughs> Wexford fade out of the game where they were very loose and Dublin were able to run through for scores a lot of that was there again in that Waterford performance of the weekend just gone by. And yet, we've got a body of work over the regular section of the league where you would say that Wexford were keeping things tight. They were able to frustrate Limerick on home soil in the first game of the league. Who's the real Wexford here? It's very hard to call that one because like, I would have thought, personally speaking, they were on the, the version upper curve and they were, they were to join the top counties. Like I, I would have viewed Wexford, especially after last year's championship, as probably, well, they weren't in the top four, let's be honest. And I thought the National League campaign and the way, you know, a new management and a fresh impetus and a new kind of outlook on things. And they were, they took down Galway and took down Limerick. And I was thinking, this is, you know, it's it's much better from what we've seen before. But I looked at Wexford yesterday and it just screamed to me of the last 10, 15 minutes against Tipperary in 2019 semi-final, whereby they were a man up and they just completely capitulated. They just, they, there was no organisation. Um, they kept, doing a puck-out strategy that was favouring Tipperary as opposed to favouring themselves. And then I looked at yesterday and I just saw no kind of, I suppose, intent to stop the rot. You know, like if the water were run at them, 
they're scoring a lot like they're getting numerous opportunities getting numerous shots off and I just don't see anyone trying to pack out defence stop the rot for a few minutes and try to get going again and I suppose when you couple I suppose defensive frailties with the fact that they shot an unmerciful amount of wise and the shot selection was so bad I mean it was so bad because like if you think of a shooting zone let's say if you draw an arc from corner to corner out around the 45 that shooting zone is the highest efficiency that's where you get the most amount of scores obviously Tag the worker covers a lot of that space but you can work around them but they were shooting from their own half back line over the sideline under pressure you know on the back foot it just didn't make sense to me and um it, it, it's I, I couldn't pick actually a positive facet over the game only for mark fanning saves i couldn't pick anything else you know i thought that rory connor and connor mcdonald were marshaled fierce well that they didn't get anything out of them now in fairness i will say that the two of them were probably manhandled for a couple of opportunities towards goal and that they were entitled to freeze in my opinion and one of them ended up in a goal the other side so i thought they were entitled to a bit more fair play from from the referee however um that doesn't that doesn't offer any excuse for the overall result and they have a lot to do now like if, if your touch work was off or if your fitness was off you you can get a body work into that but the overall tactics that the intent the attitude you know the on-field decisions you know the, the how they self-talk to each other it just was nowhere to be seen that's worrying Paul, when it comes to those decisions, look, sometimes the long-range shooting worked. Like, Dio Keefe popped over a couple of good long-range scores, but he was in good space, particularly for the one he put over from exactly in midfield. They took a lot of shots, though, as James mentions, out near the sideline in very low percentage scoring zones where the shots were coming from. That's got to be frustrating if you've had Conor McDonald going well in the league, Rory O'Connor going particularly well, Jack O'Connor going well as well, and the three of them were kind of standing in the forward line and watching shots from defenders and midfielders sail wide. Yeah, it has to be very frustrating and as well it doesn't do anything for a team that's fighting to get into a game that, look, look when they come off, it's that old thing of when they come off they're brilliant but um, are they worth the risk of, let's say you're trying to steady the ship, you're trying to get into the game and then you have lads banging shots from out at the sideline, near, you know, on the 45 and different things, like Conor McDonald had one early enough that went over grand happy days but like James was saying there, you know, it was generally towards the sideline, particularly in the first 15, 20 minutes. They weren't going up through the middle. They weren't, I suppose, maybe just attacking up through that centre back position and offloading the ball and trying to get a shot off from there. Watford, very well, in fairness to him, were forcing them out to the sides. But playing into Watford's hands, Wexford were shooting from there. And, and, and Watford are happy for that to happen because. As much as even there was Wexford man shooting from there, they were even under pressure. So it wasn't the case that they were having a shot, you know, they were able to steady up, have a look at goal. In fact, they were shooting off the back foot and just really bad decision making. And that's something that, regardless if you're an inter-county team or your club team, you're constantly saying to lads, look, there's a few things we're working on still um, and, and, and there's a few things that we control here now today and the likes of the decision making and those things, they're things we control here now, whether it's the first day of the year or it's the last day of the year. And what they were doing was just, instead of recycling it back, someone might have a pop. Or someone would win a good ball in defence, you get the rush of blood to the head and a shot from your own 65. And there's times you can do that, and when it pays off, it, great. But the position Wexford were in yesterday, where they were looking to try and get into the game, but and they were trying to, you know, they weren't necessarily feeding Rory O'Connor. There was lads having too many shots, and I just don't think that fed into you know, a good game plan for them that was going to let them build upon something where they go, okay, we pl- we started poorly in this game. I mean, it was a drawn match by the time Austin Leeson got in for the goal, I think at the 17 minute, it was a draw game, you know, so there was time to rectify any problems they had there, but they just didn't do themselves any favours. Similarly enough though, Watford, Watford's ha- um, ball handling, I actually thought in the first maybe 15, 20 minutes, you know, it, it, it was fairly slack, they were dropping a few balls, few mistakes, so they were leaving the door open for Wexford to actually get in there and maybe convert a few of them and build a bit of momentum. But but, you know, I just think a lot of this can be put back to Wexford's decision-making um, and just their own execution of a few shots. It, it wasn't what we've seen of Wexford over the last while, which is a compliment to them. But, you know, when it mattered most yesterday, they just let they let themselves down by just a bit, a bit of sloppiness all over the pitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be a new-look half-back line for Waterford by the time Championship comes around because uh, Caleb Lyons is coming back to fitness now. Maybe he's going to fit into the team. We keep on mentioning the fact that Jamie Barron is almost back at full fitness. I think Stephen Bennett's going to be back in a couple of weeks' time to come into the forward line. Uh, Pork Man, he's only getting a few minutes here and there and hasn't quite come back into the team yet. They've got great options. But the half-back line also, it seems that Fagan is uh, making wing-back his own position uh, with the way he's played over the last three or four games. So it's just options, options, options that Waterford yeah. have at the moment. Um, James, when it came to one of those halfbacks in Tyg de Burke, we spoke last week about how Kilkenny were kind of cleverly using their distribution to not allow him to try and dominate that area of the field. But I thought de Burke had a really good game yesterday. 
Yeah, he's very influential. Very seriously influential. And Paul made a great point about how they didn't attack the channels to to work it. Like if you're if you're a team like Wexford who utilizes the running game a lot, I would be attacking the big players. I'd be going after Isaac Decent to try <clears throat> get the better of him, go after Tyke to Burke and try to take him out of the game and run at them. Run at them and make them go back towards their own goal. And it's like they kind of bailed out a bit. They say we go around Tyke to Burke and try to keep him out of the game that way. Whereas in my opinion they should just go through him. As if you were running if you're if you operate a running game, go through him, overlap him, create opportunities that way. <clears throat> but he got he got on the world the ball like and I do you know I was so impressed is that um he seems to be the the quarterback of the defence now, the quarterback of Waterford at the moment. Everything about him, like his distribution is fantastic, and that's easy to see. But his body language is so good. Like it's so good with even when there was freeze given away or freeze one, should I say, um by, by Waterford, he was straight in, a bit like the rugby lads in the pat at the back and kind of getting their body language up. And it's just that kind of that kind of spread around the whole team, you know. So if there's any kind of positive thing that happened for Waterford, it, their body language is so impressive. Like and Paul I tell you as well, like that from a communication perspective, you don't have to be it doesn't have to be verbal, like it can be non verbal. And you see guys who are doing really good and they're pumped, it gets you kind of half pumped as well. It's like a catalyst for productivity. Do you know what I mean? So Waterford, that's what impressed me most about them yesterday. I just I said coming away, yeah, they scored five twenty and they, they didn't concede that much. But they came away with with the knowledge known that they are now proven to have a very strong panel a, sp- a panel of at least 23 24 guys that they can actually use in the heat of a championship and when you consider as you mentioned you had no Jimmy Barron no Conor Punty like you had no Park Manny come on you know I mean like, you, like and he's not seen Bennett so you're talk, talking about top players that weren't in the starting lineup and they still decimated you know what I thought was the top three team at present seriously impressive and like they're going forward now and that game will do them wonders and um, like they'll obviously put a focus on the league don't get me wrong to, to win it when they're gone this far um, but they're rolling nicely into the championship and they know they've got a strong panel they know they're fit and strong you can see that that's evident even just from looking at them they've got a great pattern to play and they're going to be very hard to stop so they're on the crest wave yeah Paul I'm not trying to big them up too much before they play Tipperary in the first round of the championship in a couple of weeks in Munster but like with the exception of the game against Tipperary where sometimes they went for points as opposed to going for goals in the six matches they've played they've scored 18 goals now they're a team mm. that probably carry a goal threat more than nearly any other team that we've watched so far this year yeah yeah absolutely and like first for that to happen you kind of have to have this dynamic full forward line that creates these chances because as much as the game has changed over the last few years it still comes back to having these lads that have these eye, the eye for goal that you know, get when they get the ball in the hand they're thinking of I'm going to take on the man and see what space is available to me here I, I like as well just you know Kylie in at full forward you saw him getting a point there in, in the first half yesterday and I can't remember was it Damien Wreck or Potty Foley or who it was but he caught the ball man came over beside him he just pushed him over yeah, and just stuck the ball over the bar yeah. it was a Dio Keefe yeah and then yeah. you look at the other side then you have Desi Hutchinson breaking the ball down you don't know is he going to stay outside and pop the ball over the bar or is it is he just going to decide right I'm going to turn the sixpence here and go for goal so you know defensive setups now are looking at this going we have to try and get these matchups right because these are very uh, dissimilar players you know, they play different techniques and get the matchups right in, in those departments but what I think allows Watford so well to do that is you know Wexford ideally would want to sit back on Watford there and crowd out that space but because Watford carry the ball out of defence and move it up uh, through the midfield line now okay I say that with yesterday they actually started striking from the 45 because they saw the space was already there but when the space isn't there that's where you see the likes of Kieran Bennett and these lads and they're sprinting up the line what happens then is Wexford or whoever it is have to step out on them then and that's where the space is being created now for the, the Watford full forward line for your Desi Hutchinson and so on so what's what's really dangerous about Watford is that they're not relying on other teams to give them the space in the full forward line if the space isn't there they'll run the ball through your defence they'll run it up the channels they'll run it through the centre back position and make the half back line of the opposition have to come out and meet them have to come out and cut it off have to come out and tackle them and now you know they do that two or three times and suddenly the space starts opening up for the lads inside so like you said they're creating the space they're they're taking their points which is a big thing they're not forcing the issue with the goals but they're able to see that these these um opportunities are coming and what i thought was really good about the goals yesterday was you know we're, we're, we're a bit critical of wexford that they weren't tracking back a ball will be out at the sideline next thing austin leeson you saw when he got through for the goals he just saw the space was there and never mind the three lads in the full forward line suddenly now you have austin leeson with this license to roam as we're saying and he's just going okay and we're starting to see flickers of the austin leeson that we know like that this creative kind of go where you want because you're reading the game a little bit different than the other lads so they just have so many options there that provides them goal chances that for me anyway that's why i think we're, we're seeing such high levels of goals and you're going into championship it's still, look 
again like we said the game has changed but goals still win matches if you have a team that are so rampant like that looking for goals and can create the chances if I was a water fan going towards championship I'd be saying we're going to have a great few days travelling around following these ads because by the looks of it they're going to be rattling nets around the country over the championship yeah, James, we talk about the players that come in and come out and Waterford have been able to use their panel a little bit during the league and I think that might be the most satisfying thing for Liam Cowell when it, no matter what happens in the final this coming weekend. Was it the fact that he has got a system that seems very defined now as we go into year three of the project that allows them to be plug and play? Because it seems it's not too much of a concern. Like you saw even Shane Bennett come into the team and still they were creating chances when he was playing and he's a slightly different player to what they had in the forward line before he came into the team. It seems that Waterford are able to just bring these players in and the system just works. Yeah, like I, I, I understand what you're saying. Like I, I get it. Like and it, to, the, to, the out, to the outsider, it may look that way, that when the team is rolling so well, anyone can fit into it. And it's, just, it's like a well-eyed machine. But it still comes back to the fact that Yes, the tactics have to be right and the setup has to be right, but the player themselves has has to have the quality to, to execute the game plan. So, like, it's not as if uh, Watford are introducing guys who are substandards. They're not. They're they're of, they're of the standards. So they're taking on d- defenders and attackers from top level counties and they're they're beating them. So it's not. And the system doesn't do that. It, it allows you. It gives you a platform to, to obviously progress. But the players themselves are doing fierce well. Like you look at obviously Jack Fagan wing back. You look at Montgomery. You look at Lyons. You look at you know. Daily, these guys are all they're, they're rotating goalies. It's, it's just that they've all got quality players, and it goes back to the point I mentioned mean, a few minutes ago. They have 23 24 genuine options that they can use. And I can tell you, most counties, and I can put Limerick in this bracket too, Limerick at probably have 18 players they call upon in the East Championship 18 quality players, like real top quality that can bring maybe 19, right? Galway might have 17 rating, you know. But what we seem to have at the moment, and now I know it's league, so bear with me on that one. But they seem to have 22, 23 guys that can rotate and play multiple positions. So that's... And what, what makes me say that is because they've obviously used the 15 yesterday. They've brought on the three or four or five subs. And they still have another three or four proven players to come back into it. So we're talking about, as I said, the Prunties, the Barons. Colin Dunford's now injured, so they've lost one. But they've got a proven squad. And like when you mentioned about the 18 goals, like they've scored... What have they scored? They've scored... 190 points including goals in the last six games that's 32 almost 32 on average that, that is, that's sick you know like when you think about what they're producing over the course of the game that, and that's what it'll take for a team to beat Waterford like I think Waterford are going to be hitting as Paul mentioned about goals they will be hitting 225 so 325 per game so if you're going to take them down you're going to have to outscore them and like that's why I was I was really looking forward to the game at the weekend because you had the number one attack in Waterford versus the number one defence in Wexford and the number one attack just blitzed them you know, blitz them. And that's why you look at like 62, 63 minutes gone, Wexford people are leaving the place. You know, which is demoralising the Wexford players, I will say that. Um, as a player, that's the last thing you want to see is your supporters leaving the ground 10 minutes earlier, regardless of the result or regardless of the margin. So, just a side note. Mm. Paul, when we were watching the match yesterday, you had flicked into the WhatsApp. We, we had a big discussion last week about Lee Chin and where he fits in. In a way, this probably leaves an open canvas for Darregan to say, hey, we could do it with Lee Chin's physicality. We could do it with Lee Chin's free-taking. Now I can get him back into the team. Yeah, I think after yesterday, there's no one going to ask any questions if, if Darregan just put... And I think he will just put him straight back in because... Um, Dar Egan, the one thing he'd be saying to any player across the pitch, but we'll say the forwards, is that... Look at you know I'll play the players who are playing well you know I'm I'm looking for work rate I'm looking for you know all these things if you don't show it to me you know there's lads plenty of lads on the bench there and you know you could definitely say in fairness to Rory O'Connor and likes of these as yesterday he, Rory O'Connor was working hard but they just couldn't seem to get him into the game and there was lads trying there but maybe a few more Wexford lads now will be looking over their shoulder now um, as as they're coming into Championship because. You know, I don't think they can afford to leave Lee Chin on the bench now. And that might seem like, I suppose, a bit strange. Last week we were talking about where is he going to fit in. This week we're saying that it's um, it's, a, it's an open licence now just to put him in. But on the back of yesterday, for what Lee Chin provides, in fairness, Lee Chin gets on ball. Lee Chin, he, he, he's very dynamic in a forward line, excellent on the freeze and so on. So you'd have to say that it's very rare that Lee Chin doesn't put in a very strong performance in a game. And I think even his work rate, at least, that he'll cover a lot of ground and get around. There's a lot of Wexford players, I think, after yesterday, you know, there'll be question marks over them. And I think the management will be saying, there may be team meetings during the week saying, listen, lads, what was the story here? You know, okay, it mightn't work out for a fella on a day, but where was the work rate? You know, where was the commitment? Where was the tackling? These different things. So I think now where last week we were saying the problem was that where would Darry Egan put him in? I think yesterday, amazingly enough, 
basically now gave him free reign. Just you can put him back in because no one's going to ask questions now because this apparently you know um, machine that was really well oiled and working really well. It's it didn't it, it was showing up yesterday. So now I think that dilemma is gone for Darry Egan. He can just put Lee Chin back in. It's a fairly small dilemma in the grand scheme of things, Paul. But do you think that Lee Chin? becomes their established free taker if he comes in because this has been a bit of an issue for Wexford over the last couple of years they've gone through half a dozen different free takers Rory O'Connor is brilliant at a lot of things but he's not the most seasoned of free takers maybe that becomes his responsibility for this summer but there would have to be a bit of a temptation to say right Leach in you are the guy when we get a dead ball go hit them yeah I, th- I think so and I don't think um I don't think there's many teams that have an issue that, you know, you have your player who I have to take the freeze and if you take me off them, like usually most teams have an established free taker. Let's say, for example, TJ Reid isn't on the freeze at the moment, Alan Murphy's hitting them. TJ Reid arrives back to Kenny. Alan Murphy isn't throwing the rattle out of the pram because now suddenly TJ is on it. Players really kind of have an understanding, but what I would also say is Rory O'Connor is flying it from open play. Maybe Rory Connor's happy enough not to be on the freeze, and I'm not speaking for the man, but some players are happy enough maybe not to take the freeze. And the beauty of it then with, with the likes of Lee Chin taking them, it's it's an opening for Lee Chin to get into the game. Usually the free taker will get a free in the first few minutes and, you know, get on the scoreboard. Whereas I don't think Wexford have the, have the fear of Rory O'Connor not getting on a ball or maybe not getting a score. So what I'm basically saying there is that there's the opportunity there for getting lads on the scoreboard, getting lads into a game. Lee Chin is taking the freeze, Rory O'Connor's roaming around, doing a bit of free reign put the ball over the bar so they'll have a few in terms of opening up their scores on the pitch I think they're better off having Lee Chin as the free taker because he is very good at them like you said maybe more consistent than Rory O'Connor so the bottom line is is if you get these chances to take frees you want the person standing over it that is most likely going to convert it not a case of I don't want to offend anyone here by picking someone else so I think if Lee Chin comes back he's on him he's an excellent free taker and Rory O'Connor from what we've seen over the league will be still chipping in with his one six one seven. so um, I don't think there's any fear there but I, I do think if Lee Chin comes back he will be on the freeze and we even saw it yesterday he was only on the pitch and he was straight away onto the freeze mm. James when it comes to freeze and we mentioned the Kilkenny freeze from Saturday night in the park as well uh, just going to flick up Joe Dooley's uh, tweet in front of us here because Joe Dooley was taking exception to the uh, what probably is a technically an illegal free taking technique even though the, the law book on this one is pretty open where you basically have to lift the ball up and strike it but we saw the DJ Carey style of free taking which is almost like a lift a slight pull forward and then a shot and a few people have pointed out that uh, Joe's brother Johnny used to do that with Offaly uh, once upon a time as well so uh, this isn't a new technique but Burn for Limerick there's a few players who do this on a fairly uh, regular mm-hmm. basis referee didn't call it up even though technically you know the ball should be just a lift and then a strike motion do you think this is something that's actually going to be pulled up at some point this year I think uh, there, there's certain rules that, that give teams unfair advantages right to a certain extent right? so obviously we had the rule with breaking the, under 20, the 21 plane if you're taking a 21 yard free or penalty that's fair enough that's giving you an advantage close to the goal um, you know you have rules where the goalkeepers come out of the five yard box for puckouts. don't get me started on that one right but in terms of importance, right? I really, we have to be kind of logical, logical about this. How important is that rule? You know, not really that important. How much of an advantage does it give the player? Not that much at all. Like, there's another rule in the GA that says you're not supposed to touch the grass when you're creating a sideline. You're not, you're not supposed to create any kind of divots or any kind of, I suppose, little, little beds for the ball to go on. That happens all the time. You know, there are certain rules that you have to implement, absolutely, um, for the good of the game. But for the free taking, just get on with it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Get on with it. Like, simple as that. Have you, you often pulled up for walking outside the box when you were uh, taking puckouts then? Every day. Every single day I do it. And I do it intentionally, to be honest. Um, like, if I can get away with... I probably get away with about the first five puckouts where I'll say I haven't heard the umpire or sorry, I, so on, then I get around them. After that, then they're saying to me, come on, you're long enough in the game now, stop that. <laughs> but there's days where I can, I'll try. Every day I go out, whether it's a challenge game or a championship game, I will try gain an extra couple of yards just for the distance you know and a bit of back and forth with the umpires some of them take it more seriously than others <laughs> you know that sounds like devilment more than anything else that you're ah, actually yeah. waiting for the fifth one until the umpires already said look now you've gone about three yards outside on this one you're like oh don't worry I'll keep inside the white line this time yeah they, but then you see what, what you try to do is you make them sort of semi paranoid or make them kind of question themselves so when they say you're outside no but I struck it inside then they start thinking to themselves did you actually strike it inside do you know what I mean and then you buy another one <laughs> little game you know <laughs> Mind games in full effect. I, I, I tell you what, lads, after the week that we've just had that's just gone by, I don't even want to talk about the ball going back to goalkeepers after what happened in the Offaly and oh. uh, Cork game in the Gaelic football. But hey, 
This is the thing about fly goalkeepers, though. We're getting off the beaten track for hurling. It was never really, I think, intended in this way. It was always there to stop someone doing what's effectively a pass back, which was pass the cornerback, cornerback, pass it back to the goalkeeper. You kill time. When you have a fly goalkeeper, like Offley had with Patrick Dunnigan this weekend, and it's the same with some of the other goalkeepers are doing this currently, they go for a stroll out, and sometimes they're the second receiver for a kick out when they've gone past <laughs> the player. And it was a very, very strange one in the first half where. Dunnikin had got the ball in an advanced position as the next receiver. It was brought back and thrown in. At that point, it was thrown up on his own 21. Yeah. And then in the second half, a free is given right at the end of the game because almost Dunnikin drew too much attention to it because he knew he couldn't pick up the ball again, so he was trying to shield it away from a 45. But there you go. Sometimes right. these rules don't have the intended consequences and uh, Offaly went down as they did in the hurry. Yeah, which we can... Ben, we can it was a bad day in over roughly, I have to say. It was, it was a bad weekend, Skell. It was a dark weekend. Uh, the hurling much more so, which we can maybe get into a bit later on. The, the football was almost it's expected. A, it's a wonder you're here to do the pot of time. I know. But <laughs> here's the thing. You score 13 points against Cork in the second half of the game and still get relegated. And yes. A couple of decisions along the way. A square ball decision against Mead. But look, you, you play seven games in the league, these things probably even themselves out over yeah. the course of things. James, to go back to you on Ozzy Gleeson, because we'll have a big decision to talk about. Not the only famous slap of the weekend. Will Smith took probably the headlines, but Ozzy Gleeson's <laughs> going to get a few headlines for the slap that he gave at the end of the game yeah. too. But before we talk about like his red card and him probably missing the league final this weekend, you put Ozzy Gleeson in your top five hurlers in the country a couple of weeks yep. ago on the break week. We saw at the weekend that when Ozzy Gleeson's in form and when Ozzy Gleeson is dialed in, he's very much one of the top players in the country. Absolutely. Like, I... I and you know, I probably shifted a small bit of flag for putting him in the top five. But <clears throat> like we saw again that the weekend he produced, as Paul said, like like, like little snippets of what he's able to produce. And uh, like he obviously got two great goals. He scored three points. Even when he was on the ball and sidelines, he made the, c- the correct decisions. He wasn't necessarily shooting from crazy angles. Uh, and he was very much a provider, an outball for the defence, and a good shooter as well, taking frees. So like he was the all rounder and the influential all rounder that we've we've associated with Ozzy Gleeson over the last number of years. However, as good and all as, as his performance was, uh, it was completely neutralised and effectively you know forgotten about, diminished with what he did at the end. Now I know people will. And I was just looking on Twitter and people were saying, "Oh, you know, in fairness, the extra back." took a dive and went down very easily that's not the issue for me like, the issue for me is you're, you're 19 points up you've only got a few minutes ga- left in the game you have a league final to come you know very shortly and he intended to do what he did you know whether he got him with much force or, or whatever body part he got him with is irrelevant for me don't, don't get me wrong right but he intended to do what he did and he got caught and that's it you know and people are sorry that he got caught he look he deserves it like i loved i, lo- I loved the kid as a, as a hurler right but from a, from a disciplinary perspective you know that you can like no more than some of the Limerick guys know it, you can get at him. Like you know, I've seen him sent off in America in you know in a final on America final in New York. I've seen him sent off in the club for a crazy strike. He's been sent off a couple of times for Waterford. You know, it's just it's in him, right? And if he's to really progress to a next level, like he has to kind of dem- curb that in his game. Like you would never ever see TJ do that. You know, you'd never see him do that. You would never see you know at the moment you'd never see. I was going to say Aaron Glenn, but you would see him do that. Um, <laughs> you'd never see Patrick Carver. Do you know what I mean? The top level players like who are at the at the top of their game, like Keane Lynch wouldn't do it to a certain extent. You know that kind of bent. You know that wouldn't that doesn't fly for me. And look, whether or not it was it was delivered with minimal force or maximum force, the intent was there, and the team suffered. And now they're going to be missing him and Colin Duffer for the final in, in the next few days. Um, so look, I I saw a little clip about Liam Cahill and his little. Um, you know, if I, I'm not good at lip reading, but I can probably get an, an idea of what he meant and what he was probably what he said to us after the game. So that's a correction that his game is going to have to happen, happen fast. Yeah, the first word I think that was mouth that began with F, so you can probably guess what the second word was yeah, uh, for anyone who saw that video. Uh, <laughs> he was clever enough. I think Liam Cal afterwards, he said he hadn't seen the incident uh, perfectly and that Walter yeah. would have to review the video before uh, they make any decision when he was talking off the ball yesterday afternoon. But like, the frustration would be on this one, Paul, that... You can understand if Simon Donoghue was annoyed with the way things are going when they're five goals down in a game and he pushed them into the advertising hoarding. But Gleeson has no reason to react whatsoever. You just walk back out, you ignore what's happened, you play the last few minutes of the game and you get ready for a league final this weekend. Like Having to flick back with the hurl was just stupid. Yeah, completely stupid. And uh, like you said, I mean, Gleeson had enough ammunition to... You know, inflict any sort of emotional damage or whatever he wants to. Uh, to I actually, there was a Simon Dunne who was who Dunne, yeah. yeah. So, like, I mean, at that stage, tell him look at the scoreboard, tell him whatever, or even just 
don't like again this we were talking about this a few weeks ago where that if a player is mouthing at you he's mouthing for a reason because he wants you to react if you react then i mean you're just doing what he wants you to do because simon dunno who wasn't even digging at him either like you know he wasn't it wasn't mm-hmm. like a case of two of them were jostling or anything so whatever simon dunno who said ozzy leeson bought and that's it's a killing thing because like that now liam cal it's not going to change liam cal from picking us and lease of course not but like for for liam cal there now he's kind of looking going is like is this fella capable of doing it now in all Ireland semi final? And it's it's definitely something you could see. Um, you know the cameras cut to to Cal on the sideline. You could see he was there going. He was just so annoyed with it. Like and they were hammering Wexford at this stage, but he just, you could just see the reaction of him going. What was that for? No more than the rest of us. You know everybody else was thinking the same thing. Like you said, completely needless in the situation. He could have he could have said something to him. He could have told Simon Dunne who looked at the scoreboard. He could have told anything. The fact he bought it is just. I think it's just disappointing from. Maybe from a water point of view that you know there was nothing else on the line here now and now he's not in the league final it's ju- mm-hmm. it's a very disappointing from 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 Waterford angle is there any issue lads with the way that Dunahoo went down I mean like the amount of force for anyone who's got a flick in that kind of region before sometimes the flick is worse than a, a full-on hit anyway he hits the ground but it seemed to give him some credit he tried his best to not get Ozzy Gleeson sent off when uh, the referee John Keenan came over to produce the red card after speaking to the umpire. Some people have accused him of taking a dive or going down softly to get him sent off. I'll give it to you first, James. What did you make of the incident? Well, I'm just assessing the context. So the context is that Simon Dunne, who is getting bet, uh, uh, you know, a, a large amount of points at the moment, and saying Ozzy Gleeson's up. Ozzy Gleeson does, does the action, does the intent, and Simon Dunne goes down. Fair enough, you can say he went down softly. But if you're a person and you're looking to blame Simon Dunhu first as opposed to blame Ozzy Gleeson, I have an issue with that. Like, that's not, like, granted, yeah, you can say it's a bit soft and he should have stood up and he probably didn't connect, you know, perfectly and probably grazed off his thigh. So be it. F- fair enough. Can we say Simon Dunhu should have stood up? Probably should have, yeah. But then I would take more focus and put it on Ozzy and say, the, like, the, the, the action by Ozzy was worse than the action by Simon Dunhu. And, I, I, and again, as, as I repeat, if you're looking at Simon Dunhu and trying to attribute blame to him, you, you need to look at yourself then after that because like the damage that Ozzy does to his team you know is far greater than what Simon does to his team do you know what I mean so like it just shouldn't have happened you know and especially in that position and Paul is 100% right if you're 19 points out turn around laugh at him and point to the scoreboard and jog on get out of there you know and move on then for, for 7 days time don't be getting involved in these needless needless antics for especially with so many cameras and eyes and everything on you you just you don't get away with it like if you want to hit him a good jostle fair enough like you probably won't get a red card for that it was Jesus, get, get get your ass out of town and get ready for the next ball. Simple as that. Paul, did he go down too easily? I, I, don't, I don't think he did. Initially, when I saw it in normal time, um, I thought ah, there wasn't a whole lot to that. But then when I did see, look, he hit him in the balls as far as I was concerned. And, like, it's it's a dirty stroke to do it. You know, it, there, you could hit a fella dig in lots of places now and you'd give out about a fella not going down. But I'd have no gripe with Simon Dunahoo there in fairness. Like, you know, it's it's not a nice thing to be trying to do to a fella. You could, if... I'd even change my opinion on it if he hit him in the stomach with the butt of the hurl, but like that wasn't a nice way to be. Uh, it was a fairly dirty stroke as far as I was concerned that way. So I, I, I think there can be no gripe with Simon Dunne who there, whether he went down for two seconds or ten seconds or whatever. Once it's in that region, I just think it's a bad stroke to be swinging. So um, no, I'd, I'd have no, I don't think he went down soft at all. Yeah, the Jack O'Connor send off was utterly stupid as well, and again, a very easy decision for the officials. His his first yellow card was not a good tackle, and then to throw the hurl again when you're so far behind. Uh. Oh, like, do you know what that is Will do you know what that is on, just frustration that, that's, that's just him saying F it and get out of here <laughs> I just I give up I give up Like that's what it was you know what I mean who throws the hurl I haven't seen a hurl thrown in a long time you know but that was just him saying oh, I have enough of this and just try something else you know frustration well look we know where Waterford and Wexford are now James when it comes to your power rankings not to preempt any maybe more formal chat we have about power rankings in a little bit are you, you have to take them off the top now, don't you? They're off the top, yeah. I, I'd be, I, I think I'd, I'd be admitted to a psychiatric ward if I left them on the top after a few yesterday's performance, so I think I have to take them off. <laughs> and I have to replace them at Waterford uh, on current form, obviously. Like, I don't, I don't discount what they have produced up to date, you know, in the five games, I say, prior to yesterday. But I have to take into account what happened yesterday. And when you consider how well, to an extent, Cork performed and how well, to an extent, Kilkenny performed, Wexford would have slipped down a bit, you know. Um, they've slipped down as far as four yeah. in, in truth and I don't think anybody would disagree with me that, as, that, that they're, they're falling that far so you um, have Kilkenny ahead of them then James within well, the I was just I, again like if Wexford backed up what they did in the group stages yesterday and took down a big powerhouse in Watford at a stage of the league where you think you're going to have two full teams 
definitely would have left them on top. You know, no, no, no questions. But there was two, I, I won't say essential full teams, but Watford didn't have a full team. Uh, mm. And Wexford really capitulated and they went down. And it's the manner in which they went down that kind of would be worrisome if I was a, if I was a Wexford supporter. And they were slipping down. And then when you contrast that with the way Kilkenny had performed, you know, against Dublin and against, obviously against Waterford. And you look at the way they performed for large margins of the game on Saturday. I put them above Wexford at the moment. But there's still quite, I still have, again, not to, not to switch topic at the moment, but I was still questioning Kilkenny's fitness at the moment, thinking they didn't, they didn't finish the game very well the last day, you know. It started like a like a battle of the hell but they just they seemed to die as the, as the game went on and then what what Cork seemed, seemed to go in the opposite direction but still the value for third in my opinion yeah very impressive finish from Cork within the game so David Connors from the Tomb Herald had stuck up again everyone is finding it very difficult to actually pick where teams are really at at the moment and he put up the bookmakers odds after the games finished this weekend and you've got Limerick understandably who are in as the favourites currently and then Waterford second favourites and James, you've got Galway with the bookmakers, third favourites to win the championship. Now, that's maybe reflected somewhat by the fact that Munster is going to be a more difficult championship for teams to come out of. So therefore, there's the feeling that maybe whoever comes out of Leinster obviously will be guaranteed a semi-final in the All-Ireland Championship. So it's a, and I'm using air quotes here for anyone who's not viewing us, an easier side of the draw. Yeah. Is it fair to have Galway third favourites at the moment based on what we've seen? Oh God! Well, I think by the first to me, you know, an awful lot will go away because, like, they'll have they've Wexford first away, which is a very, very tough fixture. We know that for a fact. And they've Westmead at home, which, by all accounts, you, you should say they should take care of. And then they've Kilkenny at home. Those three fixtures, they'll have either taken down two of the big dogs or they'll have lost to a draw. And you know where they're going to go. Them being third favourites, I think it's just been very generous. To be honest, I think the bookmakers are probably putting too much value on the fact that uh, Leinster is perceived to be a lesser championship. How, however, still only three teams of the Wexford, Dublin, Kilkenny, and Galway come out, so it's as tough as, as any other championship. If you ask me, um, but yeah, I wouldn't have them third. I probably, in terms of rankings in, in bookmakers, I, I'd have to put them fifth. You know, to be honest, and that's even with the with my Leinster cap on. You know, um, I, I don't disagree with the first two in any shape or form with, with Limerick and Waterford for sure um, but I do think that the, the likes of Cork and Kikini should be should be higher you know? I'm, going, I'm going to just surmise then your power rankings at the moment so you would have do you, you have Waterford ahead of Cork James are you? yes you're going Waterford Cork then you're going Kilkenny then I, I, I'm, I'm not dropping Wexford that far you know, okay, so you're going to go Wexford 4th Limerick 5th yeah I, well I see if I'm going if I was looking at Paddy Power rankings, I'd say you'd have to put Limerick first as well. If I'm looking at rankings for the championship, I'd say, fair enough, hand on heart, I would have Limerick number one, Waterford number two, and the rest you can have at it, right? But uh, in terms of current form and what they've produced, I put value on what they've done over the last couple of months. So I'm not changing Wexford on number four. You know? And yes, they did a, did a terrible performance yesterday, right? But let's see how they get on the next couple of weeks. And my, my rank has been changed accordingly, you know? But I, I do have, like, that they're going to stay at four. I'm not going to say Limerick are five. You know, I do think Galway, I know I'm, just, I'm being a small bit biased here, you can say what you like, but Galway, I'm going to trash them in at number five and look at the rest. It's a juggle, it's a juggle wheel, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? For what they've produced, because the, the, the importance of the league seems to get diminished as the league goes on, you know, for teams who know they're not going to qualify. So it's very hard to assess the last couple of rounds, or last round, should I say, because um, I, I, I discounted the Limerick game the last round they had, but I have to take value on what they did before that. So, yeah, I could stay around here in circles and I could be fighting with myself as the, the day, as the hours go on trying to justify my own decisions right? but look at I think all importantly I I and by putting Waterford number one I'm calling they're going to be Cork the weekend yeah well you, you could put all sorts of careful work into this and next thing Tipperary beat Waterford in the first round of Munster and you can just rip up the sheet and start redrawing your power whole thing goes to pot yeah <laughs> Paul how are you ranking the teams then before we talk about the other semi-final I tell you, yeah, actually, you pretty much just called out my one there. The only difference, well, obviously enough, look, we had our four semi-finalists over the weekend. Um, and then we just look, Watford, Cork, Kenny, Wexford. And I, I just have Limerick at fifth because the way the league went and the, the way leagues and championships will go as we get towards the end of it. You know, once you slip down towards fifth, sixth, seventh, it all becomes a bit of a, a grey area there as to where teams are at. But again, it is different. Though. We're saying those are the best teams at the moment in terms of their form. But in terms of the championship, you know, it's understandable. You'd look at it completely different, look at it through different lens if you were saying who's the favourites for the All-Ireland. Again, I think Limerick start creeping back up there towards the top. Um, just, you know, I think they're going to be very productive over these few weeks. But probably just because the league is coming to a head, I think we can fairly agree where our, uh, our, our power rankings are at the moment. So um, I'm in line with you for this week anyway, but I'm sure that will change over the next couple of weeks. It's about time. 
<laughs> like, I made sure Galway weren't in it anyway, James. So unfortunately, you were over on the dark side for long enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kilkenny, Kilkenny weren't anywhere near a top five at the start of the year, so we're up to three now. So I'm happy enough with that. Well, I think Limerick have got their warm weather training camp coming up, Paul, over the next while. Like, everyone's having yeah. a warm weather training camp at the moment. I look out the window here. It's uh, again, yesterday mm. was more like a championship day. I think the great Weishi Fogarty on Radio Kerry. I think his great line used to be when the weather was good for league that we borrowed a day from the summer uh, to play the game today. It felt like that yesterday. Yeah. But um, they're going off. I think they're going to Portugal for a bit of a training camp ahead of the championship coming around. I wonder for Limerick. Does missing out on the tail end of the league really matter to them when you consider the, the body of work that they have put behind them over the last two to three seasons? Limerick might actually relish having a couple of weeks off and let teams like Cork play a couple of games more in the league before they actually go to play first round championship. Yeah, I think they definitely would anyway because um, there, there's there's positives and negatives the way the league is at the moment and we've highlighted already in terms of it that how close it is to championship. Any team who's out of the league so far, look, only one team is going to win the league and we can talk about the productivity of playing the semi-finals and getting really good competitive games. Dara Egan pointed it out yesterday before the game that I think they played he determined nine of the top ten teams or something like this which is, you know, that that that's obviously great and preparation coming into a championship but for Limerick now to be out of the league and have a bit more preparation time coming into championship assess your injuries you know and press that reset button just basically say right we're done now now it's championship lads whatever about the league and whatever attitudes might be towards the league or lads trying to find their form or get a jersey or all these things that's all out the window now it's championship so any team who's out Limerick included they're using this time really productively and they're going, okay, listen, if you're going off foreign there or if you're staying in Ireland, you're going to Carton House or Fort Island or wherever it is, you know, this is now the time where every team, I'd say without fail, will do it. They'll have their two days, three days where it'll just be a concentration of this is our plan, this is what we're doing. Lads, now it's do or die. Whoever is showing now, that's who's going to be playing in championship and you know, these safety nets are all gone. So the likes of Limerick, I think, will use this really productively. And those things that we talked about a few weeks ago that, you know, the few things that they have to rectify, I, I do think they will rectify them in this time. And I most importantly, you know, something we haven't seen from Limerick as well come championship, I think they'll have what they determined to be their best 15 back on the pitch, which is something we haven't seen. As critical we have been of Limerick, we haven't seen what we would think their best 15 is on the pitch at one time. And I think when Limerick do that and they prepare properly, I think that's where we're going to see Limerick and I think that's why of course that you know they're at the top of the bookies list for the favourites so <laughs> yeah not surprising hearing them going away I, I, I think they'll use the time really well um, and Lord knows what like you know teams are so advanced now in terms of what they do on these weekends away and you know we often used to do just simple things you'd have a team meeting watch a few videos few good things few bad things and then like you know a haymaker of a match and It'd be really good and the energy would be great after it. So I think that's what every team, you know, that's what teams get from those weekends is they come out of it with a real a freshness in many ways and also this an excitement for the championship is coming because those weekends are basically like the big indicator, right, we're ready for championship now because you don't do them weekends for the league. So, uh, yeah, I think Limerick and every other team will use this time really, really well for championship. Saturday night then, James. 50 scores at the park. Really good game. Cork finishing the game strongly uh, to just come out on top against Kilkenny and book their place in the league final. Uh, Darif is given, again, I thought was brilliant. I think he's been excellent all league and uh, talking about Ozzy Gleeson getting forward. Fitzgibbon was doing it as well. Just give me your initial thoughts, James, setting the scene because you kind of gave a bit of a hint there when you said that Kilkenny had died off in the game against Cork at the weekend. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought Kilkenny do what did what they always do. They come out like ten out of ten work rate. Um, they always bring energy. I've never seen a Kilkenny team lacking energy. It's something in the water down there. But they just they came out with full intent. Um, they were the aggressors. So it was basically when you're playing a game with that magnitude, is who can put in their game plan first? Uh, came to that, and they got off to a good start. And it just they were. It looked like men versus boys for the first while, you know. And I was very impressed with the way Kilkenny manage their own book out, number one, and manage the Cork book out. So from a Cork perspective, a lot of their work, a lot of their, I suppose, platforms for attack comes from their own book out. And I was very impressed with Kikini, put, they put four guys up towards the Cork full forward line and essentially shut off the short ones to two, three, and four and kind of cover the channel for, for the ones to five, six, seven and it forced Cork to go, go long more. Kikini wants you to do that. They want you to hit the ball down, create a whole host of rooks, numbers, and then work it out. And they decimated Cork in the middle third. That's just a fact. And I was very impressed with the way they attacked the one corner. So they attacked the, 
they're they're 13 corner and they got four goal, goal scoring opportunities off it and they just kept utilizing that space and that and they brought O'Leary <coughs> for a bit of a run um, and their forwards were, were going fierce well and then when the second half happens you think right Cork were so sheepish in the first half and there was such a gap between it and then you look at the actual score and you say hang on there's only four points in it you know and a, a big talent factor I know I, put, I mentioned to you guys was Cork gave away one score bill free in the first half you know Alan Murphy got it on the 38th minute where he got a shot that's an awful sign for me it's just it's just it's a sign that a sign that you're not being touched that a Cork defender is not getting near the Kenny guy and there's no real contact there's no aggression you know so it's very similar to what Wexford did yesterday at Waterford and uh, that just seemed to flip its head completely in the second half and then Cork drew level by the 45th minute then you think right they're going to shove on they'll, they'll finish out the game here now because they have this tendency but Kilkenny come right back and Cork don't score for I think 10 or 11 minutes was it and then they finished the game real strong so it was a really it was kind of a top topsy-turvy game but then when Kilkenny's period of dominance in the like they call it the third quarter went they just seemed to go flat you know they went they, went, they died a bit like and like for them to only score 8 points in the second half was it 8 points that, like, that's not, you wouldn't associate that with a Kilkenny team and like is that worrying no it's not I just think they probably maybe they trained hard during the week maybe they introduced a few new fellas yeah, who knows I'd say but they just seem to die a bit and the fitness seemed to catch them a bit and of course with the help of a home crowd and a big a big pitch Cork finished very strong yeah and something that was very noticeable as well Paul was that Cork were able to rectify some of those issues they had in the first half in the tail end of the game when things were going quite well for them it seemed Kilkenny who couldn't not win primary possession from puck out to both ends couldn't seem to get their hand on the ball for the last eight or nine minutes yeah absolutely um it, it was funny the, the, you know the game as a whole when i saw um the way it started out in the first 10 15 20 minutes i was thinking geez kilkenny are really going to go well here and they're, they're going to give out an awful hammer and then cork just slowly crept back into it now as as james was saying like i, I really thought kilkenny went out and they were going to lay a hand on cork when i say lay a hand on you know they're going to get physical with them and they gave away a freeze and i think they knew they were going to do that anyway but they wanted to get physical and like as James was saying, Cork gave away two frees in the first half. One was Dara Fitzgibbon, who overcarried the ball down the corner, and then the second one was actually the scoreable free by Alan Murphy, and the thirty-eight minute. Like at this stage, a Kilkenny hurl carrier had actually been even booked at this stage. So you'd be kind of wondering that what was the situation in terms of getting physical with Kilkenny. And the one thing I would say with fair play to Cork in the second half that they actually came out and they hit them. Now they only gave away seven frees in the second half, but it, for me, I would kind of say that. Maybe Cork being favourites going into this match and being at home, maybe waited a little too long to see what Kilkenny were going to do before they got to grips with it. Now, something I thought they did really well, and you know, Cork fans might think it's very cynical of me. You know, we're talking. There's obviously rules bringing in about water carriers and pinging on the pitch and different things and all these different things. You know. Cork player would go down every so often with an injury and 100% most likely was injured um, maybe the odd one you could you could raise a question was it like uh, you know a small bit going down so lads could get to the line and get a message in but they quite regularly were able to get messages into the players which was kind of for all the world we're talking about the water breaks and the water break left and it gave the likes of Limerick and these teams time to reassess and what are we doing wrong what do we need to change small tweaks Cork were actually doing this very cleverly as the game was going on. Do you know, they'd use a bit of time. Players were coming over to the sideline, relaying messages. And I actually thought Kenny were a little bit naive, maybe, in, in, in that regard, that they maybe stuck to the rules a small bit um, and didn't go over to the sideline in those moments to see, listen, how do Because for though, I, I think Cork slowly built their way into the game. And the Cork that we saw in the last 10, 15 minutes, like that's what Cork are capable of doing. That's what this team is capable of doing. And they can do it from minute one. But sometimes you just wonder, why do they wait to maybe see what another team is going to bring? Like when they play Tipperary, or if they play Limerick tomorrow, I think they go out with a with a serious aggression and they go to try and hit them. And But sometimes when Cork are tipped a little bit, they tend to maybe sit back a small bit and wait to see what's going to happen. But what we saw from Cork in the last 10, 15 minutes was that's what Cork can do. That's what they're capable of doing. And to be honest... I, I genuinely don't think Kilkenny died. I mean, I, I, I think Kilkenny are up there with... Well, I know they're up there one of the most... with the fittest teams in the country in terms of most physical, strongest teams, um, well able to cover ground. I just think Cork got their act together and they moved the ball really well and Kilkenny didn't counteract that enough. But in terms of physicality, I definitely don't think they died. From what I can see with the Kilkenny team at the moment as a supporter, I'd be really happy with how physical they are. They're in savage condition. I think it's more credit to, to, to Cork 
how they set up for the last 15 minutes that they just got it right and if you look at the percentages it was 50 50 percentage at half time for possession it was the exact same thing at full time so it wasn't a case of cork held the ball it was just a case of maybe what they did with the ball and again going back to decision making how they worked the ball up the pitch and they got they kind of got their pump up as well you know they were getting scores and the crowd were getting into it so for me that was just a bit of the difference um just on the night i think there was very little in it but just cork did what we know they can do for the last 15 and it's it's a job now for Kieran Kingston to go right lads 70 minutes of this now not intermittently 15 minutes of this yeah I mean needs a complete performance James and I mentioned Darf is given who's been going really well but so is Kieran Joyce hasn't he yeah like he's been a good find you know again popping up with a score and, and kind of shutting down uh, <clears throat> a lot of like the attacks and like that's what you're going to have to have let's say if you're going to change something from last year or kind of reinvent yourself a, 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 to a certain extent you're going to have to introduce new players and here you see the same thing with Barrett and same thing with Connolly you know and like look at the way Robbie O'Flynn has grown over the last you know couple of games and a good a good point to notice is the fact that they, they finished the game without uh, Patrick Horgan and, and Shane Kingston you know two they're probably you would say better forwards you know what I mean or they're marquee forwards so that signifies itself that they've got a panel as well and then you've got the re- resurgence of Conor Lehan who was very good again again uh, in in a physical game against Kilkenny which he wouldn't have been associated in, in in years previous you know he would he would have always been associated as a fine dandy hurlers we'd say up here like where by he be he would utilize space and get away from guys and shoot but he, he was get, he's getting the mix and he seems to have I don't know was it a message that was given to him let's say when he got released uh, that he basically had to get stronger or get more physical but he seems to have taken that on board uh, and introduced into the car the cock attack and now he's one of the stronger more physical cock forwards you know himself and Robbie O'Finn for me are the two guys that are that uh, that are kind of break down defence systems if you, if you want to call it that but I think they're in a good place you know like they've, they've obviously put a lot of work into their youth over the last number of years with Project Corkness whatever you want to call it in their academies and whatnot, and they're kind of wiping the floor and under age systems in the last last couple of years so they're in a good position but like if, if, with, with Cork right and I know this sounds a bit bad right but I would have always looked to Cork as a player and I would have said um You'll never get a fight against Cork, like you know. If you if you if you if you win chest to chest against them, like you, they won't, they'll back down. If you know what I mean, they won't face up against you. Like I would never ever in my life say that about a Kenny lad or a Tip lad. They'll always face you up and go at you. And I think if you got on top of Cork, you can keep them down. That's that's my honest opinion, right? And but the same doesn't apply for the other counties. So and that's still. And when Paul mentioned last week about and I, I, I took Cork to win the game. Don't get me wrong, because I thought everything kind of stacks in their favour a bit at this time of year and where they're where, where they're at and where they're going, right? But if you look at, I suppose, how to put this now, in the heat of a championship, when things go well, you know, everyone's 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 very vocal, they're very verbal, body language is fantastic, crowds behind you. But when things don't go well against Limerick now for a period, which and which it won't, there'll be a time now where Limerick will get at them, what are they going to do? Like, are they going to lie down or are they going to go after them? And until such time as they take on a team for a full 70 minutes, as Paul said, and they get a result against the Limerick or against the Walford, I still can't buy into them as being one of the favourites do you know what I mean like I can't I just can't Like, I, yes I can say they, they'll beat you know, they'll beat Kenny in the home patch but I can't say for the championship for most of the championship that they can take on week in week out physically and mentally can you take on the big counties can you take them on and, and see, see see can you finish out the game on top um, and again I'm only, take, I'm only saying that because from my own experiences in my own career and I think Paul might agree with this one is that there's always a sense around Cork that they have a bit of a soft touch in their stomach and that if you get after them you can keep on top of them well, Paul, you've used the phrase more than once in the last few weeks when we were talking about Cork's good results. You've said, jury's out for me a little bit. Is what James just described, is that exactly why you were saying jury's out? Yeah, exactly. James, James summed it up there. It's just the thing that we haven't seen the full package from them. We haven't seen this 70 minutes performance that, you know, there's no chink in their armour, that there's no kind of a small bit of a lapse there that a team might capitalise on. And like James said, there's the question that if a team go far enough ahead against Cork, you know, it's because it's it, a, t- a team in the modern game now can can be up by nine or ten points in you know in ten minutes, and then suddenly you're asking questions. We saw it was it last year, year before last year, Limerick and Tipperary and ten points down at half time, and, and Limerick come back. But Limerick had shown us they're capable potentially of that. I don't think anyone even believed up until we saw that that they were capable of it. But there's a few questions just with Cork that, like we, like I said in 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 the last question, there was just that. You know, they started slowly. They waited to see what Kilkenny were going to do. You know, kind of champions or teams who are dead set on winning an All-Ireland or winning a league, they don't do that. They don't wait to see what the other team are going to bring. Like, Waterford don't wait to see what another team is going to do. Um, 
Kilkenny didn't wait to see what Cork were going to do at home. I think, in fairness, they knew they were going to Parky Cueve and they knew there'd be a big crowd and they knew they're they're going to test their metal against a serious team. So they didn't wait to see. I think if Cork wait too many times, that it'll be to their detriment, you know. And it's just something they have to rein in on because we've said it. We don't question their fitness. We don't question the hurlers they have. We don't question their skill. You know, we don't question any of that. The only thing we question is where the head's going to be at when they step over the white line. Because like we played Cork in the league final in two thousand and twelve. In, in, in Turles and we bet them out the gate there was very few changes in personnel and they bet us in 2013 in the championship but you know it was like night and day in the two different teams when, once we got on top against them in, in the league final and okay you might say it was a league final but we wanted to win it and the game was over by half time but in, in, in the match in 2013 in the quarter final once they got on top you know they started a bit of bravado and they started getting in your face and they started you know but they waited till they were on top to start doing this you know so the, the like what James was saying that's just an example of where I would question sometimes maybe where the heads are at with, with some of them or maybe with, with them as in, in general so until we get answers to that that's why we've used the line, or I've used the line, the jury is out with Cork at the moment. But I still think they'll be there, thereabouts. But it's just, can they tidy up the few things they're lacking at the moment? James, you'll have Cork supporters who will turn around, look at this podcast right now and say, go back and look at the video of the first 35 minutes of the Gaelic rounds. The fight was there, the determination was there that day, the score taking was there that day. Is there not enough in that first half to say this Cork team are different to what they were last year? No, and it's like it's like um, we talked about free takers a while ago. <clears throat> it's grand doing the league, let's say stepping over a free, but if you're doing it in the hot cauldron of a championship game, can you be as as good, you know, in in June and July as you were in February and March? You know, when the pressure is really on. And yeah, you can look at the league game and you can say right, Cork were up for it and they they wanted to take a scalp off Limerick, especially after last year Ireland. But I still won't buy it. Like you know, yes, there's evidence. You know, there's evidence there to, to say that it's possible. But like, is it probable? I don't know. You know, until, until I see it in, in front of me, until I see it for a sustained seventy minutes, until they, until they beat Limerick or beat Waterford, I can't say that it, that it's, that's more than probable. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like one swallow doesn't make a summer, and a broken clock is right twice a day. So if they beat Limerick once, fair enough. But if they beat them again in the championship, I I'll, I'll be the first man to hold my hand up and say fair play to them and. and Let's see what they can do for the rest of the championship. Well, Paul, we've got that chance to maybe get more evidence this weekend. If it's about beating a Waterford or if it's about beating a Limerick, if Cork are going to win the league title in Thurlis, they're going to have to beat Waterford right on the eve of championship. And maybe we'll know an awful lot about Cork by half past seven, eight o'clock on Saturday night. Yeah, absolutely. And w- one of the things we've been saying over the last few weeks is that, you know, depending on each weekend you know you can't read in too much into matches but I do think with this one this is a good opportunity well it's a great opportunity and I'll certainly for one um, will buy a lot more into the I suppose the hysteria around Cork or that people are saying that you know they could really push for an All-Ireland this year just once you know they go out and they take a scalp off, off Waterford because I do think again I think Waterford will go to this going Lads, this is a great chance for Silverware we're here to win it I think we'll see a savage Waterford team coming out and I don't have the same questions about Waterford as I would with Cork in terms of will they turn up Waterford will turn up you know Waterford will turn up on Saturday night and I do think Cork will turn up with the scenario I do think they will turn up but it's just a question like James was saying that right now you know go down here now you're going to play in a neutral venue this is going to be very similar to championship we're going to be down in Turles you know pressure's on you here now go out get a bit of silverware they're more than capable of doing it more than capable and I do think you know we'll be sitting here next Monday if Cork do win it I'll be for me that's a big thing then I'm going okay yeah yeah this this team is learning this team is maturing because we don't question them for the players um but we just need to maybe see that bit of a I suppose that bit of a confidence and that bit of a maturity that they decide we're going out any day and we're good enough to beat any team and we're not leaving it up to maybe one or two players as a team, as a panel. We're going out and performing. So I think this is a brilliant opportunity for Cork and hopefully they see it the same way. And like I said, Watford are going to come and I think they're going to perform really well. If Cork perform, I think this could be an absolutely brilliant match altogether. And it'll be, it'll certainly for all of us never mind the Munster fans it'll be really enticing for uh, a head of championship if we get a great match on the weekend yeah it whets the appetite nicely James because they didn't meet in the same section of the league which is you know it's been a while since they've played since last year and we it's going to look set things up very nicely for the Munster championship with both teams having difficult games in the first round against Tipperary and Limerick respectively do both teams go all out on Saturday and try and win this and then have seven eight days to get ready after that yeah, I think um, <clears throat> when Paul mentioned about them playing Cork in the league final, 
in 12 if they wanted to win it like if I'm in Cork's position or Watford's position I am dying to win that because at the end of your career like you, you know Damien Hayes said it before about that it's not really about what you play it's about what you've won you know to a certain extent you know that's what some people would assess you like and I think for Cork people for Cork players how they haven't won obviously in Ireland in, in 17 years or a league title since 98 I think that's 20, call it 23 years you know the players are under a small, I won't say a bit of pressure like, but there's obviously an expectation on behalf of the supporters that they want to win this game because they've made the final. So because they're there, I think they'll put they will put more value, in my opinion, on winning this game that that Watford will. Now that kind of doesn't make sense to a certain extent. You say that everyone's in the final, and they want to win it. Watford have won two leagues in the last fifteen years. You call it. I think Watford have they do have bigger things in sight, and I think they're in a better position to go forward, better in the championship. Um, I just think yes, they'll want to win the game. Don't get me wrong. That sounds like it's just going to show up. They want to win the game, but. Do they hold as much value on a league title as Cork have at the moment? I don't think so. No, I think Cork need to win this for themselves. You know, for the team, um, for the players, for the group that's there, for Kieran Kingston in his second term as manager, I think they have to win this league and and uh, count that as real progression and a stepping stone and a milestone for this group going forward into the championship. Uh, Watford, I can't say as much. I think they're more advanced, you could say, in their progression than Cork are. You know, I think, they've, as I said to you in a couple of podcasts uh, earlier, that they have more value on the championship, a lot more value on the championship than than what teams would have in the league. So, and look, it's going to be an interesting game. Um, I hope the weather is good. The pitch will be always good below in Thurles. Um, the referee let it off and hopefully in for a cracking game. Well, James, my wishful thinker when I see both teams after half a dozen games, these have been the two free-scoring teams that we're just going to have a free-scoring final at the weekend. Mm, free-scoring, yeah. I'd say Watford, they, they make it free-scoring. They, they have such a good plan you know they're such a good group of players and let's say the tactically they're very good we spoke about the tactics but the group of players is very strong that that they, they create their own opportunities and they don't they don't live off freeze effectively you know um cork again they're, they're going well i'm not saying they're not going well and i know it the way when i'm talking here it sounds like that i'm throwing a bit of shade a bit of negative shade towards cork but i'm not i just think you know they have to prove it more than once they have to back it up every time they go out because because there is when they come to the finale or they come to a stage in a championship or whatever they just seem to explode or implode should i say um, so I'm looking forward to this game and that win Watford get on top of Cork at some stage and they will there'll, there'll, be, there'll be proper patches for, for periods of the game where Watford will be on top of Cork I want to see Cork respond and, and, uh, and see can they, they put Watford to bed Right Paul you can hear James is clearly going towards a Watford victory this come weekend who are you expecting to win on Saturday? Yeah I'm going to go with Watford again Um just think again that panel again we go back to talking about it I just think they have that panel you look at the subs they brought on the weekend and those lads would be starting on lots of teams you know I think they w- a few of those lads will be starting come the weekend as well but you know the likes of Kieran Bennett and these lads like whoever whatever six Watford go and start in the forward line on the weekend there's going to they're going to have three or four lads on the bench chomping at the bit to come in really la- like lads who have been tested now at this stage over the last few years for Watford I think that's that's a really I suppose telling point but something I am looking forward to see something I would, I would think Cork are really good at at the moment is you know, we're looking for a way to, let's say, if a team is looking to get around Watford, we're talking about Tyke de Burke is sitting on that D and that you don't want to go through him. Something that Cork are actually quite good at is when they run the ball up the pitch and they run towards midfield, they start having lads that, that half-forward line coming out looking for the ball. And once they get it, they're dynamic enough to either go, turn, change direction, go for a shot, or they have another player coming running through that they pop the ball off. Why I think that's significant is that for Watford, it'll maybe ask the question of Tyg de Burke that is he going to sit further on the D? Tyg de Burke is capable of coming out and mixing it out around the middle of the field, no hassle. But I just think to unhinge Watford that way, you have to negate Tyg de Burke in some way. And Cork have that tool at their disposal. And we saw him doing it multiple times in the league, and they did it in Parky Cueve in the second half the other night, where they started running the ball up the pitch, and suddenly there's, there's droves of Cork lads running shoulder to shoulder, popping the ball off half-forward line is coming out. If the half-forward gets it and he can't get around his man, he now still has one of those runners off the shoulder to pop it. And they got great scores off it. Why they don't do it more often, I don't know. But I do think that's something that can get at that Watford back line. And then if they do do that and the Watford back line starts stepping up at him, that might create the space inside for, let's say, if Jack O'Connor is playing or whoever on, on, on the Cork side to maybe get in and get those goals or like that you know you might have Dara Fitzgibbon will run through the middle create the space we saw Tim Amani doing it last year once they created the space they're able to exploit it so I do think that Cork have the tools there to beat Watford but I still think that I actually do think that a silverware for Watford will be a big thing because you know winning league finals 
okay, they're, they're forgotten about fairly soon afterwards once you get to championship. But you have a great few days after it. I'm not saying great few days in the pubs or whatever. Some about great few days. You're looking forward to getting back into training. You've, you've a bit of silverware. You know, you maybe did go for a few pints and you enjoyed the night and all these things. And there's a great buzz about it. So I think, you know, Waterford will compound the great work they've done over the last while. No more than Cork will if they win. But I do think Waterford will be going, lads, look at it. We're here now. Bit of silverware. Let's keep the feel-good factor going. Send the Waterford ho- fans home with a bit of silverware as well. So... Um, I, I'm still tipping Watford. I, I'm going to stick with them, but that's not to say that I I, I do think if if Car come and they give us this seventy minutes, it's such a tough one to call. But I'm going to stick with James in this one. I'm going to go with Watford. James, away from the finals themselves, uh, the Division Two A final this weekend between Down and Westmead is going to be on. Uh, the TG Carrow YouTube and then you've got TG Carrow showing the Division 1 final as part of the double header at Semple Stadium Hurling was pretty well catered for this week just gone by too where you had both the semi-finals on TG Carrow and the relegation final between Antrim and Offaly was available on their uh, YouTube and on their app so Mm -hmm. for Hurling you were pretty well covered football it was a little bit more difficult and we talked last week about four divisions that had so much on the line and there was so much happening and yesterday was good fun if you were just trying to keep an eye on who was relegated who wasn't and Division 1 was a complete dogfight and TG Carrow went for a red zone type effect and I thought it worked quite well but it got a lot of people talking and I know I I threw up on Twitter after the game I think long overdue I felt this for a few years and there's a few other people who've brought it up I think Anthony Daly and Nisha Waldron over the last while too that the GA really need to have a look at expanding the amount of streaming that they're doing but also having like an on-demand service where people can go back and watch it and midweek highlights there's just so much came off the weekend just gone by I think it's impossible for League Sunday to try and fit all that into two hours in the league yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's the responsibility of RTE or a TG Car or whoever to to promote the game, you know, the, the way the GEA should be doing. Like, I, I would always look at other sports and say, well, well how are they doing it or what are they doing that's uh, that's proven so successful? Like, and you look at... Now, I know we're talking about global sports here and we're talking about sports that reach a far larger audience, but you can take their mantra or their the method in which to do things and you can apply it to a smaller scale here you know and it, sh- it should work so like you look at the Formula 1 the way they did the Netflix, the Netflix special and they have their own channel like there's no reason why the GA couldn't potentially have their own YouTube channel or some, some channel of some sort where you can pick out all the games you want to watch like and if you look at the viewership numbers at the end of each year you'll always see in RT let's say that they'll say the Thai show will be number one and they'll say they'll say the football and the hurling will be, will be two and three you know so there's, there's demand there for the games and I think it's a bit unfair, like if 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 you're from a county that is is, is currently classed as not a tier one, and you can't access your own county's your own county's uh, 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 game. So like, and some people will say, "Oh, go to the game." Look, not everyone has afforded the opportunity to go to the game. So at least they should be afforded the opportunity to view it in whatever platform that is presented. So I think there's something there for the GA to look at. Um, I think they have to look at it to be honest, because if we're going to grow the game and keep interest against sports that are becoming more more kind of into our living rooms and TVs, like you know the rugby's and the soccer's and all these they are pushed so hard and like if you look at a soccer game and the highlights they'll give you seven or eight minutes of a highlight of a nil draw where there was two shots you know but they'll give you seven or eight minutes of it you know whereas in hurling we could have a cracking game and it might be shown at all you know like the, the the Westmead game there at the weekend like it sounded like a cracking game when you assess it from you know just again from looking from from live uh uh, online let's say through the 42 or through through Twitter or whatever it's looks like a cracking game and you'd like to be able to view that you know um, on, on a more continual basis so I think yes there's, there's, there's very your, your tweet was correct um, there's food for thought and I think is a necessity I'd say yes um, in definitely definitely not not saying do it tomorrow but I'm saying get it implemented and get it trialed and get it going and figure out what the little nuggets are and what the issues are to, to figure out and then get it, get it certainly in place for probably like next year or the year after you know yeah, like I'd love just for it to be a supplementary service. Not for a moment am I trying to argue about taking games away from RT or TG Carr, who do a huge service by having it on free to air. Like just to James's point, I just very quickly Googled while he was speaking there. Seven of the last of uh, the top 10 in 2021 on RT were sports programs. So the Late Late Show, understandably, is way out there in front. But then you've got the All Ireland football final. You've the Sunday game, which was shown after the hurling final. The Sunday game live features three or four times between uh, the football semi finals and the hurling final. 
And then you had the final of UEFA Euro 2020, which was also inside the top five as well. So you'll get plenty of people who will say, look, Saturday and Sunday, RT and TG Car, all they show is sport. And I want an option to watch something else. But it's very clear that there's a massive audience there for it. Free to air is the right place for it to be for that. But I think, Paul, like when it comes to a supplementary service, an on-demand where you could go back and watch full matches on the GA YouTube or maybe classic matches, some kind of midweek magazine show to look forward to the games, a chance to maybe break down some of the games that happened the week before. To me, it seems a no-brainer to actually get a service like that. And I think people would pay a subscription for it too. They would, yeah. I mean, you look at anyone, talk to anybody now. Everybody has subscriptions at the moment, whether it's your Netflix, it's your Amazon, you know, p- people have your Spotify, everything. So people are willing to pay, you know, to to get what they want to get. And I do, I do think maybe the timing is right now because the conversations are being had. And like you said, you know, you put out a tweet at the weekend and I got a huge response. So obviously, you know, um, there is people there very eager to get this up and going. And and like like you said, you know, no one's asking for this on a plate and just, you know, it's very tough on RT as well in many ways because, I mean, the Sunday game gets its slot. It's hard to cover all the games. It's hard to go into real in-depth analysis. Some people want in-depth analysis. Some people just want to watch the games. Um, and some people as well just want to maybe just see their team recognised of a Sunday evening as well, which is a very important thing and it's very understandable. But like you said, access to these games and, and, and the ability to watch them back is a big thing because, okay, lots of these games are also going to be on at the same time, but the ability to, to say that, look, I, maybe Sunday evening there I can watch back on one of the matches there, you know, down in Westmead or whatever it is. I haven't got time to watch it now, but I can look back. The ability to do that would be a huge thing. Or even like this now, you know, for, for us to go back and look over a match and look at different things, there's lots of people who want to do that as well and pick out a few things or maybe I didn't see something. I want to go back and have a look. So having somewhere that actually caters for all that, I do definitely think there is a market for it now. Um, and again, it's probably back on the GA to actually go, right, okay, this is what our supporters want. Uh, there's an appetite there for it. Well, what's the what's the format? How do we do it? And I think there's enough platforms out there to actually get this out. YouTube obviously being the main one, the fact that you can, you can stream live games on YouTube as well. So I do think, you know, there seems to be an appetite there for it. There seems to be a real willingness to get this off the ground. Um, I'm definitely not the man to tell you how to do that, though. So I will say that I, I'm not going to be saying here that I'm an expert on how we'll do this. But certainly there are people out there that feel this is something that would really benefit um, just the coverage of inter-county games in general. Because some weekends it's great, but it, it can be a feast or a famine other weekends. Two other things that they really badly need to put in. And these ones will be very inexpensive to do. There needs to be a stats database on the GA website. Uh, I still can't believe a few years ago when uh, it was getting closer that Callanan and Canning were getting up towards record titles. And in Canning's case, he was able to break the scoring before he retired. And you had people genuinely having to go back through old programs just to double check where some players were historically. And also, I remember when Killian O'Connor was going for the football record. Like you saw what happened in the AFL last week, where everyone knew the thousand goal was going to be scored. And so everyone at the stadium was ready for that to happen. In GA, unless I think a journalist makes a decision during the week to go back through the records and to make sure or something, these things don't quite get the hype that they probably should. And sometimes players who are going for record appearances, maybe I'm an anorak and wanting to be able to have easy access to all these. So I think it'd be great if there was a centralised database. The other thing is live scores. Um, uh, there's a match tracker on the GA's website yesterday, but the two or three people who were trying to do it, they were having to deal with a lot of games happening at the one time across hurling and football yesterday afternoon. I think there should be some... It's a, There's a reason that there's so many apps and live scores and GA league, league tables who are fantastic on Twitter and were brilliant again all weekend. But these services are popping up because the GA are not providing them themselves. And if the GA were able to do that as an organisation, I think it would make a huge difference. Like, I would love if I didn't have to have... 20 intra-county uh, county board accounts on Twitter to have to double-check scores as games are going by and local radio stations and whoever else has thrown up live scores. I think it'd be great if the GA had on their app a really well-updated live score for a day like yesterday because they're never going to get a better audience than particularly three um, intra-county football leagues that were in the melting pot plus, which it turned out to be a hammering, but what was an interesting semi-final. Like, mm. that's, that's the time that you maximise in your audience, lads. Yeah, good point. Like really good point. And if you were to go back about the records thing, well, um, again, I know I'm referencing different sports, but like you look at the NFL, the way they 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 have records about records about records, and it's just it's a way of advertising their sport in a certain degree, you know. So like it's it's like, um, and I think it's generational. If I'm honest, I think I think the, the willingness for 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 these records to be put on show and to be put into into record as such will be 
our generation and Paul's generation and the generation after us who were so, you know, in tune with social media and so, and so in tune with laptops, tablets, etc., phones. And there, there, there's a cry for instant information. And like, with a smartphone, let's say, there's instant information available to you. And like, if you were at an event or at a match and you want to see who's who scored the most amount of reason championship, it'd be great if that platform was available. And I don't think it's a question of budget. Like We all know the GA have it in the coffers to, to create a position or to create a couple of positions whereby this can be tracked, you know. So the, the, so the whole statistics thing and the, the obtaining records and keeping records is an easy one to fix. There just has to be a willingness on behalf of the GA to implement it. It's, it's, it's that simple. However, the one thing with the live scores, you're right, there's a lot of apps. Sometimes the technology is failing. It's not. It's you know. It's not accurate. And you'd love a centralized platform that produces that kind of information. Because again, we're 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 all sports people, and we want to to know how every game is going. You know, not just the one game that you're watching television. You want to know how every, how every game is going, and uh, and and have the information to hand. So you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a topic, and more than Paul. How how do we implement it or do it? I haven't a clue, <laughs> but there are people who will get paid a lot more than me and who are a lot smarter than me that can figure it out and get get it going. Well, it might be needed a bit earlier than next year. I saw Morris Brosnan had uh, tweeted yesterday from the forty two a breakdown of the fixtures on the Saturday and Sunday of the May Bank Holiday weekend. There is a remarkable amount of hurling in football and now because of the way the season has mm-hmm. been squeezed. Previously, we didn't have this issue where the hurling round robins used to be on and the football was in the early rounds and there were only a couple of football games dotted across those first few weekends. Both these championships are coming like a train when they start and there's going to be a lot of meaningful fixtures overlapping and on at the same time. And hopefully it's not going to be a frustrating experience for those who are trying to follow everything that's happening because now with the way that these championships are run, a lot's on the line in all these games. So a lot to look forward to. Again, we can't solve it. I would love if anyone has any ideas about it or they want to poo-poo it on a purely financial basis or whatever, stick it in the comments and uh, we'll go back through them uh, next week on the show. I mentioned the Division 2 final and James, I want to ask you about Davy Glenn because... David Glennon's back for Westmead. Uh, he was injured earlier in the year. They've yeah. had a bit of a mixed campaign in Division 2A, but they've got to the final after beating Kerry. Glennon was back in the team, scored a goal. I think it's quite remarkable that you've got a guy there who's got a Celtic cross, but has also got a Joe McDonough title. And in the autumn of his career, here he is now playing out and enhancing a team who are a little bit further down the ladder. Yeah, like and like I know Davy Fierce well, like he'd be a good friend of mine and I think he wasn't ready to finish his intercounty career at the time he was, was <clears throat> he finished with Galway. Um and uh, like he still has he has a lot to offer to Westmead and yes, he's he came back late in the year in January and had a couple of injuries and I think probably the travel was difficult for him because they train they train in Mullingar and Abbottstown, let's say. So from, from his house to Abbottstown is quite a trek, so you don't get out of the car and get into training, it's easy to get a muscle injury. So but for him to come back and uh, you know, he scored one one at the weekend, and is he's now an, a really important player. Like you look at last year's final, he was operating between wing forward and midfield, knocked over five points. Um, so for that kind of addition to a team like Westmead, you know it's colossal. It's colossal. Like and so when you look at the fixture between um, themselves and down a few weeks ago in QC Park, there was only two points of difference. But they're getting Nyla Bryan, who's come back from an ankle injury, and they're getting Davy back into a foreign unit. So. I can couple that and I can't help but think down if you travel three and a half hours to go to Thurless, you know. Mm. That's going to be a very intriguing fixture. But look, Davy's back in good form. He just needs minutes. Um I think that obviously there's a, there's a greater importance on the championship for Westmead, but again, no more than what Paul said a while ago about being in the league final. When you're there, you want to win it, of course. And it's just about getting more minutes into him and getting him sharper. And uh like he's a high energy player, he's a seriously high energy player. Like he has so much energy off the pitch, on the pitch, he nearly annoys you sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, he's always in good form, like so. He's a great person to have in, in a group setting. Like, he's, he, I won't say he's the centre of attention, but he's definitely, you gravitate towards him because he's so, he's so enthusiastic and he's charismatic and he, he's, he's quite witty and funny, you know, and uh, you can knock strips off him, like, verbally, and he still wouldn't bat an eyelid, you know, so he's a great person to have in a group. So, that's what I mentioned about Westmeath. Yes, you can see on the pitch, he scores X amount of points, he'll create whatever he creates, but also for camaraderie, and for the social side of it with, with the team he's fantastic so I think they've got a good one in Westmead and as well James it's a very young forward line that Westmead have currently like Jack Illen has come in and become a very important player and has taken actually quite a few of their frees and you've got Sil Killian and Kieran Doyle the two yeah. twins there are quite young within that forward line as well like he has to add that little bit of experience if those guys are trained alongside someone who was in such a high performing county like uh, the group that you had with Galway as well. Yeah, like whether or not he got you know all the minutes in 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 twenty seventeen is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is he was exposed to that setup. He was exposed to how players train, apply themselves both on and off the pitch, 
Um, he saw how things should be done, and it really and truly, he shouldn't be communicating that to the guys in Westmead. Um, and, and I think he does. Like he again, he'll he'll tell you. Let's say um, he'll tell you straight. You know, <laughs> he's sometimes he's sometimes he's nearly too blunt at, at, at the delivery of his messages. But he's good to have. You know, so if you are a young player, a real young player, if you're 18 to between 19, 20, 21, whatever, and you're looking towards someone in your group setting is to and to ask them, you know, what's what's the correct thing to do here, or if, if even if it's a simple question about managing your own social media, let's say, or managing negative comments, or managing, let's say, the, the whole club county thing. Anthony, it could, look, it could be Anthony, nutrition comment, whatever it is, right? It's always nice to have someone who you can call upon who has done it, who was exposed to it at a high level, and they can offer you that advice. That's why he's, like, he is important. And I think, I think whether you're back, forward, like, even, I'd be interested to know, would the manager even talk to him about what way, what way let's say, go, we operate in 17? Who knows? So, like, he's just, a, he's a he's a fruitful resource to have in Westmead. Paul, Ulster Hurling was much maligned for quite some time, but there is a possibility if... Down overturned the odds and beat Westmead for the second time in a month. They could be going to Division One for next year. Antrim have stayed up after their victory against Offaly in the relegation playoff. It'd be some turnaround for a down team who were playing Christy Ring a couple of years ago in Championship to be going back up. I think it's the first time since two thousand and seven they'd be Division One, and for Antrim to have survived for the second year in a row. It'd be huge for Ulster hurling to have two teams exposed to Division One hurling next season. Yeah, it would, and it, I think it'd also be. Um I suppose it'd be testament to the work that they're doing up there as well. Um, so often these conversations are had, and we, we've discussed it obviously previously, just about people floating the idea of a, maybe an Ulster team or different things. And just, you know, that's not what the Downs or the Antrims or any of these teams wants. They want to be there in their own merit. Um, and it'd be a great achievement. And again, like you said, for the second time, you know, it, it, it'd be a great achievement to beat West Mead. Um to be up Division 1, I know it'd mean a huge amount for both teams as well. Okay, West Mead have, t- have tasted it a few years ago, but you know i i just think amazing story for down and like you said for for ulster hurling as a whole to have antrim and down potentially up there that's a huge thing and i think it's a great i suppose it'll be great for everyone up that direction to be saying look at what's possible when you do build it mightn't happen today or tomorrow but over the next few years if we have the right structures and systems in place we can go toe to toe in terms of getting our teams up there okay no one's expecting them if they do get up there um to you know, to really, I suppose, lay their mark down straight away. But to be up there alone would be a credit to the work that they're doing, and also it'd be great for them just to travel around and get to play in, you know, wherever, get to play your players or Galways or Kilkenny's or whoever. It'd be great for them, great for those players as well. So it's it's certainly exciting for um for both teams for down and West Speed over the weekend. But you look, I th- I think down supporters especially will be will maybe have a small bit more um vested interest in this weekend just that you know the potential to be somewhere they haven't been in a long time up in division one um it, it's really exciting for the hurling community up and down yeah i think for west Mean, for joe fortune they know they've got leinster championship and Kilkenny to come uh the week after it's such a flip to what happened to them last season where they played championship went really well in the joe mcdonough celebrated and then a week later they had to play their division one relegation playoff against leash and then went down and the, the year kind of felt like it had a bittersweet end by comparison well at least this time around they're going to know what their league position is before they actually start the lens championship and what a boost it would be for westmead if they were pretty promoted back to division one straight away like when it comes to ulster division two b final you've got Derry, who again were in a christy ring final last year in crow park they go up against Sligo for the right to go into 2A for next season. It's an all Ulster 3A final this season where you've got Tyrone against Armagh. You've got Fermanagh who are going to be contesting against Longford in the Division 3B final. So the Ulster teams have been very upwardly mobile and Donegal performed well in that league this season as well. So uh, it's been a good time for those teams who have been trying to build forward. I watched the game, lads, for my sins, uh, the Antrim Offaly relegation game on Saturday. And I think it could be a very clear indicator of where championship form is ahead of the Joe McDonough championship because off you have to go and play against Antrim in the first round of championship in two weeks time as well and Antrim won so comfortably um, they scored 1-2 without reply injury time in the first half they ran in chances like the other teams had done Division 1A throughout off have got real problems down the spine of their team a very young midfield uh, David King has been deputising at number six because of injuries they've had to Kieran Burke and the fact that Keelan Kiley has not been available. Their best hurler, Ben Keneally, is playing at fullback when he's probably required to play at centre back. He's played at centre back a bit like the day where he was given a specific job on Tony Kelly, but they look soft down the middle and they conceded a lot of goal chances. That if Antrim were in a mood for goals and they'd no Neil McManus either, which was a big blow for Antrim before the game, but if Antrim wanted goals, they could have got a few more of them. And 
awfully are only averaging a goal a game and it's been a big big problem for them their two goals were scored by Owen Cal from dead balls a penalty and a short range free at the weekend too so I think it's going to be a big ask for them to win the Joe McDonough for me from what I've seen so far in uh, those two teams and also from the teams in 2A I think Antrim are now the strong favourites uh, to go straight back up to the Lee McCarthy so maybe that just shows James that that exposure to Division 1 hurling that Antrim have getting in recent seasons and you know maybe playing a bit of Leinster Championship and I know they've been relegated back down to the McDonough but that exposure helps when you go back down to hurl at a slightly better level and you could tell that physically at the weekend they were just in a better physical condition than Offaly too yeah i think exposure like whether it be positive exposure or negative exposure it's just very important to get exposure in any way shape or form like and i think when you look at the game that antrim played against offaly they just attacked at a pace and intensity that offaly weren't able to sustain at all and that was evident in the first goal the first goal like again as a defense man looking at it god you'd be very disappointed if you're offaly management wouldn't you they just strolled through right all the way through and and knocked, knocked it in and that was disappointing that that I suppose awfully couldn't come to terms with that kind of on, on attack they couldn't flood numbers back and make at least turn it into a bit of a physical battle as opposed to a hurling battle you know because it was evident that Antrim had better hurling uh, and, and pace of hurling and skill at, at, at that time uh, of where they're at right now Antrim are, are probably a level above Offaly but you know slightly I'm not talking about rungs and rungs of levels above them but they're slightly above them so I thought it would be in Offaly's interest to try and kind of neutralise it somewhat make it a bit more of a defensive game and try to attack them on their own a bit but it just didn't transpire that way they went on a kind of 15 on 15 game and Antrim just, just they exposed them like only for Owen Cahill Owen Cahill popped what he popped 2-6 two, two uh, as you said 2 goals from place balls 2 very well uh, taken place balls but again it kind of probably put a more positive look on the on the result and what it really what what the game actually produced um but look often you're going to have to do this they're going to they're in the they're in i still believe they're in the phase of a rebuild um and it kind of started with michael dignan taking over as chairman over the whole board say so they're going to have to put processes in place and put academies and structures because they have the facilities like and they have they have the schools so so the, the nuts and crannies are there it's just to try and, and so get the wheel turning and, and, and keep it turning and keep everyone short of the wheel and it's going to be frustrating like there's going to be so there's going to be bad days and there's going to be some awful days. Like yesterday was an awful day from an awful perspective, but you're going to have to just ride it out and keep going and keep going. And like Antrim are a test from that. Like, and I have great admiration for the people of Antrim because, you know, I'd say nine tenths of the country would have disbanded them and met, met them into an Ulster team come back a few years ago when they shipped a couple of beatings, you know. And I'm just, I have admiration for the passion they have there. And I've never been up in Antrim um, on a coaching perspective, in their playing perspective. But from what I gather from hearing people like, whether it be Liam Sheedy up there, even David Fitz last night said on the Sunday game, Tini Cahill, etc. There's great, great hunger in Antrim to grow the game. And I, and awfully being a very proud county and what they've produced both in football and hurling in their last 40 years, call it, has been exemplary. Probably the best, you'd say, small county, wouldn't you? Uh, across both codes like what, for what they've produced. So I'd say there's great appetite in awfully to try and get back to that to where they were when, you, when Ireland's... In, in the in the Dooley's area in the Diagnons area so it's just a, it's just a matter they have to keep at it you know it's as frustrating as it all keep the tour of the wheel and keep going yeah I think too on that if you want to get the real Antrim experience a few years ago they were playing at Ballycastle as opposed to Corrigan Park you get a real feeling for the heartland of hurling within Antrim if you go to Ballycastle particularly because you get to what feels like the edge the uh, the literal edge of the country you can see Scotland out in the distance uh, when you play a game at Ballycastle and it's a really kind of strong hurling area again Corrigan Park we've mentioned how difficult it is for any of the teams in the Joe McDonough who are going to be going up there uh, based on Antrim's record that they've had and the other one, Offaly, Offaly need to get Ushin Kelly fit again. They were very unlucky that he picked up a knee injury. He was the player of the year in the Christie Ring last year. Yeah. And he has a physical profile that some of those Offaly players just don't have. Offaly didn't have a ball winner last year. And you know, Owen Cowell was a guy, he was like you a few years ago, Skell. He was the goalkeeper in the Offaly team. And then he kind of hit fire with Jeez, the club yeah. in like Bar and moved out the field. I played against him, Will. We played against him in, in Tullamore in the first round. played really well that day, as in, I remember. In, in what year was it, 18? I think, I actually think I made the match. Yeah. He did, I think he got man of the match. He was excellent. And then when I saw his name outfield, I was saying, what is after going on here? And that's that's not a great sign. You know, that's a sign that they're, they're pulling out a good goalie who's also effective out, out midfield. Like, that's like pulling Owen Murphy out, out for Kinney and putting him outfield. You'd never dream of that, you know, because he's so important to Kinney in the goals. But it just, it, it screamed to me now, if I'm honest, right, that they're awfully were a bit short outfield and they to take Owen out of the goals and put him, put him out the forwards. Here he is scoring 2-6 yesterday, so... Michael Fenley's trying to change his style of hurling there currently at the moment, Paul. 
did you always get a feeling with Michael Fenley towards the end of his career and look he had to manage injuries and especially his knee in the last few years of his career and he was telling me before his back was playing up quite a bit and he wasn't able to train all that much in his last few years with Kilkenny but did you always get a feeling that he was probably going to go in as a coach when he finished uh, not necessarily no um he wasn't one of the people who would have struck me straight away. Not that I didn't think he had the tools. Of course he did. And and, and it was something definitely I think any team I, I knew would have taken him. But, you know, Mick was obviously always involved in the strength conditioning side of the house and was very in-depth on that and, is you know, has all his qualifications on it. And certainly from that side of the view, I thought he might maybe get involved in the team. And definitely, you know, some of the real top-tier teams thought would be interested in taking him on. But I didn't see him going down the coaching route so quickly. But, you know, Mick has a great view on the game. It's, it's kind of... Obviously, his physical prowess was what really made him in terms of how he was able to cover the ground. But, you know, when he'd have team meetings over the years and stuff, Mick had come out with really great things in the meetings in terms of how he observed it from the middle of the pitch. And, you know, he's in, he, he always played in a really important role there, a hard role to play in the midfield in terms of transitioning the ball between, you know, the, the backs and the forwards and even just covering the ground. So, from Mick's perspective, the way Mick played the game and how he dominated the area around the middle of the pitch whatever way he would read the game I would say that his mind in terms of the way he would set up a team I'd have great belief in terms of he knows what he wants to do but I think Mick would obviously understand as well that you know it's going to take time certainly with Offley as well and he's very committed to the job but that he understands that okay you might see a lot of results really early on and we'll see great steps but maybe it'll plateau a small bit then and you kind of have to weather the storm a small bit and look again to I suppose inject a bit of new life back into it and keep pushing on but he was never one of the players initially that I would have said yeah Mick straight away once he's finished will go in you know Mick always had the injuries and different things and I thought maybe look he'll step away play a bit with Balahale and just step away altogether but obviously it's an ambition of his to get involved in a team um, and look you know I, I know we're talking maybe a small bit um not doom and gloom at the moment with Offaly, but you know the work he's done since he gone up there has been has been really good, and um, he's been really committed to the job. But no, look, I don't. I, he wasn't one of the lads straight away. I would have thought went up there, but fair play to him. I think he's he's done really well, and I think this is only kind of a building blocks for him now for for the future. Mm, it's, it's going to be intriguing. It's something we can talk about in future pods. Uh, how some of these kind of former Cody players have now in the last two or three years gone and kind of spread their wings elsewhere and we've, we've seen what Eddie Brennan's been able to do we're talking about Henry Shefflin currently you know, Herity and Kildare you're starting your coaching career at the moment Paul too you've been coaching underage who knows where you're going to end up maybe we might I'm getting slightly worried we might have to replace you Andy Moran style at some point when you get a job yeah Skettle will be cutting the back off me here in a few years now probably but uh, no it's interesting like it's a funny one because um you know, I, I certainly was saying I, I have no interest in getting involved and I just went in as an ambassador role with the under-16 Kilkenny Hurlers last year. So they're basically just looking for a few ex-players to maybe step in and get involved in development squads. And I went in the, the under-16s, I just really enjoyed it. And I wasn't expecting it, which is, a, which is a mad thing. So for a lot of players, I think that's maybe somehow how they get involved. Some players maybe just have the ambition that, yeah, I'm going to get involved straight away. And I see the likes of Joe has got involved with the Galway Miners and different things. But if you asked me last year, I would have said, no, I'm not looking to get involved. And I, I kind of did just said, do you know what? I'll, I'll go in, I'll see what's involved. With COVID, I didn't know how many sessions there was going to be, but just really enjoyed it. So that's something as an ex-player, which I think sometimes you unearth something you weren't expecting that you really do enjoy it. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be a good while before we're, we're giving out about me here in the podcast and you replace me. Right, you're safely in for season two <laughs> with the 2023 season. James, yeah. uh, the audio listeners will be very aware as we finish up for this week that we sound slightly different you guys are on fancy microphones which you've probably seen on youtube as well <laughs> are the rumors true that this is out of the flooring porter betting syndicate that we were they're trying to, to hide the money here will that's what yeah. they're trying to do now i can either <laughs> confirm or deny that <laughs> <laughs> and has your wife forgiven you for disappearing for the best part of a week yet yeah i've moved back into the spare room now back into my own room so i, I think uh, uh, all is good there now at the moment <laughs> i don't think i'm allowed to go to entry <laughs> <laughs> good man well look you might be allowed to watch the game on Saturday when the uh, league final is on uh, within the house itself after a week yeah. in the bad books lads thanks a million for joining us on uh, this week's episode of the pod and looking forward to reviewing the league final next week sound lads cheers man.